All right. Um, perhaps if you do conflicts of interest first, and then I'll uh, I'll take over for uh, item two point one. Oh, the May is here. Oh, ah, fantastic. Here we go. <clears throat> Oh, Madam Mayor, we've got you. Hi, sorry, I just have again an issue. I couldn't get onto my computer, so I'm back on iPads. Oh, okay, no problem. Thanks. We're ready when you are. If, uh, we've yeah. only, uh, happy to make a start if that suits you. We probably yeah, that's... we're just going to see if there was any conflicts of interest first. Anyone got any conflicts they need to declare at this point? No. All right, Madam Mayor, if you're okay, I might introduce uh, item 2.1. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, look, um, councillors, thanks for tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, for most of the evening, all things waste. Um, and look, given that there was obviously some discussion um, at our councillor planning day on Sunday about uh, a real interest, I think, from the community and, and councillors around where we're heading with waste reform, um, we had, uh, sort of foreshadowed and uh, acknowledged that waste is a big ticket item for council and had already scheduled a briefing tonight on that topic. Uh, and it's uh, been fantastic that we've got Gillian Risley, who's the Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group Chief Executive Officer, who's going to present to us first tonight. So I'll introduce Gillian in a, in a minute. Um, and I'll also then uh, introduce after Jill, we also have council's group manager operations who looks after our waste team, Tom Rasmoski. Uh, who will also do a bit of a presentation about Brimbank specific waste reforms. So, it, Madam Mayor, if that's okay, we might hand straight over to Jill, who will share her screen. Uh, councillors, we are recording tonight on the basis that some councillors are apologies uh, and would like to be able to watch this session later. So, just to keep that in the, in the, in the back of your mind. Uh, over to you, Jill, and uh, I'll ask you to introduce uh, Richard as well, please. Thank you, Neil. And, and firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak with you this evening. We, we love being able to speak directly with, with councils. We spend a lot of time um, engaging and speaking with our colleagues uh, in the waste offices. And so it's always nice to, to be able to uh, speak to councils and particularly our new councillors. So thank you very much. Um, I'll apologise to Councillor Lancashire, who uh, I'm sure knows a huge amount about uh, what I'm about to present tonight. So I'll just apologise, Bruce, in advance um, in case your uh, some of this information has been repeated uh, from things that you've uh, previously been to or that you know. Um, and I also just uh, wanted to say that, uh, acknowledge Neil and Tom, who, in my opinion, uh, are really engaged and knowledgeable waste officers. So we obviously deal with waste officers primarily from the 31 metropolitan councils, uh, but also the 79 councils across the state in a number of capacities. Um, and I'm not here to do a performance review, but uh, obviously, uh, in, in my opinion, Brimbank has really well managed waste services and, and um, has a high level of expertise and engagement um, from the officers. So. Uh, you, that puts you in good stead uh, for the significant reforms that, that are underway. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, tonight. If I can't answer them, I'll, I'll uh, pass on to my colleague, uh, Rashad Saeed, who's joined me here this evening. Rashad's our Director of Procurement Services. Uh, if it's not our area or, or for our agency, we're happy to refer you to the, the right agency and, and can connect you and facilitate that. Or if there's a really curly one and we don't know the answer, we, we won't make it up, we'll take it on notice and come back to you. Um, but, but with that, I might kick on. I'm hoping that slide changed at your end as well. It did, fantastic. So I thought I would just take the opportunity to very, very quickly provide an overview of the different agencies that are involved in waste uh, across Victoria. So. The Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group, which I think has the worst acronym in the, of all the agencies in uh, the Victorian Public Service. It sound, MWERG sounds a little bit like a, a cold. Um, so we tend to call ourselves Metro Group, um, uh, is responsible for uh, ensuring that Metropolitan Melbourne has the capacity to manage waste and, and recycling uh, for, for the next uh, 30 years. In particular, we focus on the next 10 years. Um, but we work very closely with the 31 Metropolitan Councils and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about specifically what we do. Um, but we work closely with our Victorian uh, government portfolio partners. 
Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are 10 agencies involved in the delivery of waste and resource recovery. So on the map there, you can see the boundaries and municipalities of the seven Victorian waste groups. Um, I've, I've also provided on the slide, and I, I'm more than happy for the slides to be shared if they haven't been already, but uh, there's a link to a PDF there that actually goes through the roles of each of the agencies. But we also work very closely with DELP, uh, the department, EPA Victoria and Sustainability Victoria. So 10 agencies being involved in waste and recycling and resource recovery obviously is, is a crowded space to some degree. Uh, and the new Recycling Victoria policy has proposed uh, a new waste authority, which will to some degree centralise and remove all the overlap of functions. So we're looking forward to that uh, coming online. Uh, in terms of the role of each agency, um, DELP, which is um, the, the department, develops those statewide strategies, plans and policies to achieve um, Victoria's waste and recycling objectives in line with the legislated requirements and government commitments. So they really um, have an overseeing role and a policy and a legislative role. Um, the EPA is a public entity and it's independent from DELP. Uh, so it reports directly uh, to Minister D'Ambrosio. The EPA undertakes activities that are of a regulatory nature, um, so that they're really supporting compliance and enforcement of environment protection regulation relating to waste and resource recovery. Sustainability Victoria's uh, statutory objective is to facilitate and promote environmental sustainability in the use of resources. And they do this by developing projects and programs um, around sustainability. Many of you will have seen their education and behaviour change programs. <clears throat> um, sustainability Victoria is also responsible for developing the statewide waste and resource recovery infrastructure plan, affectionately known as the SWERP. And the SWERP uh, is important because it provides Victoria with a roadmap for planning and investment in waste and resource recovery infrastructure over the next 30 years. Now, the SWERP is supported by the seven regional implementation plans, uh, including the Metropolitan Implementation Plan. So we outline the path for implementing the SWERP at a local level uh, over broadly a 10-year period. Um, what Recycling Victoria is also proposing is that Sustainability Victoria will prepare a new plan, which will be transitioned to the new Waste Authority to replace the SWERP and the local plans. And this new plan will be called the Victorian Recycling Infrastructure Plan, the VRIP. And as many of you would know, in waste and resource recovery, we love an acronym and it's just littered through them. So um, if I don't use the full name and you, please shout out uh, because we, we tend to drop into acronym land very, very quickly. So Metro, um, all of you will, should have received an email from us in the last week to sort of provide a little bit of context about what we do. Um, Metro is a statutory body established under the Environmental Protection Act. We work with, as I mentioned, Melbourne's 31 councils to plan for waste management and resource recovery facilities and services across Metro Melbourne to facilitate joint procurement of facilities and services um, for waste management and resource recovery for on behalf of councils and to help build capacity and knowledge of councils and their communities of best practice waste minimisation and the opportunities and options available to improve services and infrastructure. So quite specifically, what we do in that uh, regard is we respond to planning issues. Um, we manage contracts and arrangements between councils and service providers. So we manage over $100 million uh, of contracts on behalf of councils and facilitate the procurement of um, um, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of contracts. Uh, we support councils and assess the needs uh, for, from a planning perspective of waste infrastructure and landfills across metropolitan Melbourne. Um, and that, that's not, not always an easy job, unfortunately. Uh, we coordinate a huge number of networks and user groups and run, run workshops and events. So um, to give you an example, we run Ednet, which is our network of education officers. Um, we run um, our transfer station network, which is for all the transfer station. We do a huge amount of work with the waste officers and run user groups, which um, are 
the councils divided into each of the service providers that they use and make sure there's a, um, a quality engagement between the provider and the councils. Um, uh, Clean, which is our litter network, I could go on and on, but there's um, there are a huge number of networks and events that we run. And that's uh, to really support councils in, in the important role that you have in engaging your constituents in waste and resource recovery. Um, we also deliver uh, education and awareness raising programs and support uh, for councils. A recent example would be our multi-unit development materials and our new litter toolkit for councils. Um, and we do uh, uh, some research as well. So understanding what the social trends are and what the community expectations are around waste and resource recovery. In terms of how we're, we're structured, <clears throat> um, obviously uh, the Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Board is appointed by the Minister. Um, the board keep me in line uh, and I have my executive team of which there are five directors. We're also supported and the board is supported by the Metropolitan Local Government Waste Forum and our Strategies and Policy Advocacy Group, which we call SPAG, um, which Councillor Lancashire uh, is on, as well as our Technical Advisory Reference Group, which uh, we call TARG. So they inform the forum who then informs the board. So, you know, the, the purpose and, and the design is very much to have all 31 councils having the elected officials being able to be informed about waste and resource recovery and be able to um, advocate or, or uh, raise issues with our board directly. Um, this graphic shows the, the population growth over the next 30 years and also our waste volume. So this is um, waste to landfill. Um, and I thought I'd mention it just because it's important when we're discussing waste and resource recovery that Melbourne is a growing city and obviously is a growing city with a population of uh, projected 7.7 .7 million by 2051. We also see an increase in um, consumption and, and consumption results in waste and resource recovery requirements. And this is the makeup of waste. So what I really wanted to highlight here was municipal solid waste, so curbside waste makes up 24%. Um, commercial and industrial, or CNI as we call it, 32%. And the largest waste contributor is the construction and demolition uh, C and D at 44%. I've also broken down what the waste is. Um, and you can see obviously the opportunity there that we see with garden waste and food waste. And, and over the next 10 years, we'll see a lot of councils starting um, to look at moving uh, to a FOGO service or, or increasing their uh, garden recycling so that you can trans move that waste from landfill uh, into, into the green bin. Um, from uh, in 2042, Metropolitan Melbourne uh, will be managing around 16.5 million tonnes of waste annually. So it's, it, it is a substantial footprint that we have. I wanted to mention the Recycling Victoria policy, which is, um, uh, but it's, it's a really a once in a generation step change in the way that we manage waste and resource recovery. The, the reforms are really significant. It's a $380 million package um, from the state government, which is, um, you know, just, just such a significant increase in the focus and investment in waste and resource recovery. So uh, an exciting uh, decade ahead. Um, the action plan really is aimed, it's a Recycling Victoria in, in a nutshell, is an action plan to deliver a cleaner, greener Victoria with less waste and pollution, better recycling, more jobs and a stronger economy. And I thought I'd just very quickly um, run through uh, what some of those key policy initiatives um, include. Uh, a four bin waste and recycling system by 2030, a new glass bin by 2027, uh, a food and, and organic service, FOGO as we call it, uh, by 2030, a container deposit scheme or CDS as we call it by 2023, um, a standardisation of bin lid colours uh, across the state and a waste to energy cap and the details of that are, are yet to be revealed. So we obviously, as I've mentioned, 
work very closely with the waste officers and we will keep them informed of opportunities for engagement as part of the policy. Obviously, they have a huge role in the delivery of the policy at, at a council level. And I'm, uh, I believe Tom and Neil will be speaking to you about that. Um, well, there's other opportunities that we'll certainly bring to their attention, such as the council and community grants that are being managed by Sustainability Victoria. So those things that come up, we'll make sure that Brimbank are absolutely advised and, and involved. In terms of our role in the delivery of the Recycling Victoria policy, our role is very much around supporting councils, um, whether it be um, communicating grants, but uh, or the supporting them with transition planning, which were um, submitted to DELP, or um, uh, providing additional advice. But the key way that we really support councils is through the procurement of contracts and, and services. And I thought I'd run through what we, is certainly in the pipeline over the year ahead uh, and our role a little bit more in that. So as I mentioned, um, we, uh, we, we manage uh, $100 million annually of, of contracts across landfill organics and recycling. Um, and we lead councils in the procurement and management of their curbside waste and recycling processing contracts. Uh, and we do that th with, through entering into tripartite arrangements with, with the private sector. Uh, and we manage the entire procurement process, which includes market sounding, working groups, ACCC authorisation, and the Department of Treasury and Finance approvals, the tender process and evaluation and consultation with councils, and then contract management. And the reason um, we, we are passionate about this is because we, we believe that, that there are significant benefits to collaborative procurement, and, and they include reduced tendering and contract management costs, um, the opportunity to, to sort of uh, ensure that we see that value for money by providing recycling services um, in a collaborative manner and, and aggregating that tonnage. And obviously those costs and minimising those costs are pretty essential because as you would well know, they're passed on to ratepayers and, and constituents. Um, but we also uh, you know, are really keen to see new entrants into the market, new technologies uh, and superior environmental outcomes. Um, and, and that is much, uh, much more readily achieved through collaborative procurement than each council um, individually going out um, to procure services by themselves, in part because simply the tonnage isn't often large enough to facilitate that additional uh, investment in infrastructure and improvements. So one of the most significant pieces of work that we're undertaking in the next year is a statewide collaborative procurement for the processing of curbside recycling. And we're doing that in partnership with the six regional waste groups or WERGs as, as we're called, on behalf of the 79 local councils across Victoria. Um, and the reason this is really significant is because it's the first time that we've actually gone out as a state looking at for recycling processing services. The way that traditionally we've aggregated or, or conducted collaborative procurement is region by region. And that often doesn't make a huge amount of sense. And so this is the first time that we've actually been able to really wipe the slate clean and look at councils and the clustering of councils based on geography and based on tons that's going to work not only for industry, but for um, councils directly. So it's actually, um, it, it's a really significant piece of work and an exciting piece of work. Um, the procurement's being informed by analysis of the current state of the recycling market that we have, as well as the future demand. And obviously the Recycling Victoria changes um, and those policy implementations will change uh, what that infrastructure from a processing perspective will look like over the next 10 years. Um, and we're really keen to maximise those efficiencies and but also provide those local services as much as we can. Um, so as I said, you know, the, the collaborative procurement approach offers, offers that large volume to the market, delivering the economies of scale and greater certainty for industry. Um, and what we're hoping, and certainly our, our, our contracts will ensure that it drives investment and transparency um, and ensure that we have, uh, you know, the, the service provision uh, and reporting that we deserve so that we um, so that we know that we're getting the outcomes that, that we want. 
as you might be aware, um, landfills in the Melbourne southeast are, are filling up, particularly the, the sewers landfill, which is expected to close at around 2025-26. And at the moment, we don't have any more landfills in, in metropolitan Melbourne scheduled to be, to be built. Um, and as I, I mentioned at the start, household rubbish uh, in the area, including the southeast, which has a number of growth corridors, um, that, that in the southeast, rubbish is expected to increase by 40% over the next 25 years. Uh, and so we have, a, we have a looming issue. We have uh, a landfill in the southeast that's closing, and we don't have any infrastructure in the southeast that's um, scheduled to come online. So to address that, we're running a procurement process for advanced waste processing on behalf of 16 councils uh, to find an alternative to landfill. Uh, and, you know, by undertaking that joint uh, process and the, the collaborative procurement, we're guaranteeing the sufficient volumes of household rubbish um, to ensure that uh, over a significant period of uh, contract term, which we're looking at 20 to 25 years, uh, we'll be able to ensure that we have the incentive to invest and build a really significant uh, facility. So those facilities, um, as you can see, uh, look, cost around 400 to $450 million. Um, they create about 400 uh, construction jobs and a number, about 100 ongoing operate, operating jobs. So they're really significant investments. Um, uh, the, the three tenders that have been shortlisted as part of this procurement uh, um, Veolia, Environmental Services Australia, Secure Environment Australia, and Secure, many of you may know, are a larger uh, Spanish-based um, waste group um, with a significant international footprint, as well as Ramondas, um, who many of you may have uh, heard of as well. So the next stage of the process is that to co-develop the technology solution. So we've been deliberately technology agnostic up to, up to now. Um, and we're working with councils to sort of move into the final stage of that procurement with a contract to be awarded at the end of this calendar year. Um, councils are looking at uh, establishing a special purpose vehicle uh, so that they're able to manage and enter into that contract uh, and, and administer that. Um, from, uh, I guess the only thing I would uh, mention with that, I mean, this, this project will help the Victorian government deliver on its Recycling Victoria target, which is to divert 80% of household rubbish um, from landfill by 2030. Um, but I think Rashad would agree. I, I remember walking into this role and uh, we started on the Southeast Advanced Waste Processing Procurement in 2018. Uh, initially it was a business case and then it obviously has moved into the procurement process and I remember in the first couple of weeks in this role thinking you know two and a half years for a procurement process why on earth is this taking so long um, and what I've discovered is that actually the advanced waste processing is much more complex than you would initially think um, uh, from the surface and you've got to ensure that the technology is right and the technology is going to deliver what you need it to for your communities um, and so we've actually sped up the process, but in our speeding up the process, it's still, we've got a full calendar year ahead of negotiations um, with those three proponents. So uh, it will deliver the technology for the Southeast. And, and part of uh, our desire with this procurement was to ensure that the Southeast were managing their waste in the Southeast. So we don't have a trucking of waste from the Southeast over to the West um, and the North, which, um, is, is currently sometimes the case um, and certainly would be the case with the Suez landfill closing. So it is really an important um, procurement for us and we're really excited about that coming online. Uh, food and green waste, and without dobbing Rashad in or adding to his intro, but we're, we're currently actively working on our organics procurement strategy because we recognise that our organics is an area that we're going to need to go back out um, to tender and go back out to market for. Um, uh, it, it's been a really successful, um, you know, FOGO and, and organics recycling has been a really successful outcome for collaborative procurement. The, this image on your slides here is of the Secure um, uh, site in Dandenong South, which opened in June 2019. It's a $65 million state-of-the-art composting facility. Um, we're really excited about that 
um, that infrastructure and the opportunities of, of organics and increasing organics recycling. So we'll certainly have more to, to um, advise Neil and Tom about in, in the year ahead with that. They were the main things that I wanted to cover off today, but I'm really happy to take any questions or um, see what, see what I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get you to stop sharing if that's okay. So the mayor can see all councillors um, to see if there's any questions. Thanks, over to you, Madam Mayor. Well, I do have actually a question. Where is landfill um, in, uh, in um, South East? Where is it? So it's in Hampton Park. It's um, the sewers landfill uh, is uh, located there. Um, when looking at the capacity at this stage, uh, you know, I think we thought that landfill would probably last a little bit longer, um, but on discussions with sewers that they are indicating that they're looking at a 20, 25, 26 close of that landfill it will reach its capacity. So what's going to happen with their waste? You said sometimes even now at the cases that they bring it our way. So what's going to happen with that completely closes where that waste is going to end up? That waste will go to our new advanced waste processing facility. And that's that $400 million facility that we're currently identifying sites for. But that will be located in the southeast. So it's and to us that um, we keep the infrastructure where close to where that um, the waste is being generated. When is that due to be ready? So a uh, contract will be awarded at the end of this calendar year and uh, we expect, hopefully, <laughs> Rashad? The facility, yeah? The, well, the it, facility will take two to three years to be built. So what we've designed is that that facility should come online as that landfill closes. Okay, and when do you uh, expect that landfill actually closing? Well, we're not, we don't know for sure, but because obviously it depends on volume. Roughly like a year or more? 2025. 20, okay. 26. Um, sorry, something. And one more thing. Why is the case that we still take rubbish on our side if they still have that um, landfill there? Yeah, it's, I, I, well, the Southeast do send their land landfill to sewers in the, in the Southeast. Um, there's also a landfill at Rye that the Mornington Peninsula mm -hmm. own and operate themselves. Um, but, you know, there's a huge amount of CNI and CND waste that also goes into those landfills. Cleanaway, as you would know, have a really significant transfer facility in the southeast, um, which has bulk haul abilities to, to take that across to their MRL site. I've got one more last question from you. Um, I'm not sure if you do know anyone uh, tonight here. How many landfills do we have across Victoria? Uh, we would, I don't know off the top of my head. I would be guessing and I, I don't want to guess, but we can certainly take that question on notice and get that across to you. It's important to, to understand the difference between inert and putrescible landfills. And I, 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 I'm Certainly, I'm sure you're across that, but municipal solid waste can only go to putrescible landfills and a very limited number of putrescible landfills in Victoria. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tarkos has got a question. Hi, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Jill, just my question is, you know, I, I'm not against the idea of collaborative um, procurement by any um, stretch, but my concern is that I look on, at, on the other side of town and I look at um, councils like Burundara, which divert already 69% of their um, waste away from landfills. And I think to myself, this council has contributed millions of dollars towards the landfill levy over the years. And we are still uh, de highly dependent on um, land landfilling all our waste. And I guess I'm not having a go at, you know, the collaborative process, but what I'm saying is, I, as a councillor, I'm looking for best value, but I'm also looking at environmental cost of what we do by landfilling everything. And then I look on the other side of town and I think, why are they different? Why are they um, somehow already 10 years ahead of us, because we're by the time we do it, it's going to be 2030, they're already doing it now. So my question is, I've got to answer to my community who is knocking on my door and saying, why are you going to sign another contract for four years to landfill everything when you've been banging on about 
um, climate emergency, reducing emissions, um, finding alternatives for waste. What, what, what value are we getting out of this collaborative process when we're so behind the eight ball in, in our waste disposal still? No, I'd, there's probably two things I'd say. Borandara have, have, um, have introduced FOGO and as we are looking at that graph before, the, the food and organics um, component of, of what goes to landfill, it really does take a lot out of the red bin, but you've, you, you can only do that when your com community is ready to roll that out. It, it is a significant change and a, and a really considered change. So it's not a lever you, you pull lightly or, or without consideration. My personal opinion is I think Victoria is behind on the way that it um, manages waste. And uh, when you compare us to uh, some of the European cities, for example, and anyone who's seen those pictures of Copenhagen where they have a waste energy facility and the lovely um, the ski run down it with the cafe at the top and everyone loves it, uh, it, it seems completely... Um, uh, it seems like a different world to the way that we manage things in Victoria at the moment. But what I would say is things are changing and but the, these are big facilities, big investments. There's a lot of technology out there. You've got to make sure you get the right technology, which is, as I mentioned, I couldn't believe how long this advanced waste processing tender was going for. And then you start to unpick it. Um, the type of technology is really important. The social license to operate around that technology is really important, um, particularly uh, incineration or gasification of that waste. Uh, you really need to understand what your waste is composed of. We have done significant auditing of the waste in those 16 councils in the southeast because you need to understand the base load that's going into those facilities. It really is a lot more complex, but what I think, um, what I'm excited about is this facility in the southeast will be a, a Victorian first of this size, and I think what we'll see is a lot more, um, you know, people will see the facility, they'll understand the facility, and we'll start to see that um, grow more and more in Metro Melbourne, but also across Victoria. But it's not a quick lever and it's got to be a really considered lever because you've got to get the right technology. Because what I've, um, what I've seen overseas as well is um, uh, councils and, and you have to aggregate uh, to, get a, to, to get that sort of infrastructure online. You have to be able to aggregate to get um, new FOGO and organics processing infrastructure online, you, you actually, you literally can't do it council by council because the tonnage isn't big enough and they, that those projects won't get financed unless there is that collaborative model. Um, but it's not something, uh, you know, going back to overseas, I've seen councils pick the wrong technology and I've seen them pick, um, uh, there are white elephants that aren't being used because it, they, you know, they just said, oh, I'll take that. So you, you can't do that. It's got to be a really considered process and, and we're doing that in the southeast. So uh, I think I say that because it feels like a really long time to us that we've been doing that procurement, but, um, but you've got to do it properly. Yes, Councillor Lancashire. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just on that $400 million recycling plant, um, which we're starting down there. When are we looking at uh, that sort of being reproduced to the west north um, for a full recycling um, process? And uh, there's just meshing that in with um, waste to energy and other things, which requires a constant stream. Uh, there, there seems to be, um, uh, I think, a difficulty there in the sense of if you're going to have a $400 million recycling and and build a new um, industry base on the uh, on that waste um, versus just burning it. Um, how's that going to mesh um, for our side of town? So the reason, so the, so the statewide collaborative procurement for recycling, um, I, I would guesstimate is around a billion dollars worth of uh, services that will be going out to market for. So it will be absolutely significant. The $400 million is for that, uh, what we call advanced waste processing, which um, we're still technology agnostic at the moment, but we are getting to the pointy end where we're starting to specify the technology, but waste to energy falls within 
it's a type of advanced waste processing. Um, so we will see that come online in about 2025. The recycling point you make is a really important one. We've got to make sure that what's in the bin really is waste. It's stuff that can't be recycled so that we're really only putting into those facilities um, what we need to, the absolute minimum. Um, and uh, if we're not doing that, that's that's where it becomes a concern. So uh, we've got to be, and I think that's really um, the waste to energy cap aims to sort of limit the amount that we can put into waste to energy uh, for that reason. So we know that what's going in there is actually really waste and anything that can be recycled is being diverted into that that proposed forking system. Um, yes, Councillor Papali. Sorry, I was actually reading um, one of the briefings about the advanced waste facility, processing facility, and it said briefings um, for proposed um, solutions would for the north and west would commence early 2021. Is that Yes, sure will. So what we're doing in, um, thank you for raising, I probably should have mentioned that in my last uh, answer as well. So the South East have a burning platform because they have a landfill that's going to close. So we really wanted to focus all our resources on making sure we had a, a successful procurement uh, for those 16 councils in the South East. The North West councils have said, we're also really interested in this. What does this look like? Now, um, one of the things that we're intending to do this year is um, develop an opportunities paper for Northwest councils to say, look, this is, um, here are the opportunities for you in the Northwest. But I think the most important thing we're going to do in the Northwest is capacity building of waste offices and councils so that people really understand the technology, they understand the risks, they understand um, all the various attributes that go into that facility. So at the end of this calendar year, we've got councils in the Northwest that are able to have those conversations. Um, the, the business case process before our procurement started in the Southeast was a two year process. So those councils in the Southeast have really been on this journey now for four and a, well, including the pre-procurement so three and a half years. Uh, and a lot of that is making sure that they're able to understand the technology and the risks. So we have our legal advisors, our uh, commercial advisors and our technical advisors. So our CADIS are our uh, technical advisors and they go through and make sure that um, we really understand what, what you're buying. It's a really 20, 25 year purchase, um, $400 million facility. You've, you've really got to, you know, as I said to someone, you wouldn't buy a car without understanding what was under the hood and it's sort of the same. Yes, Councillor Lancashire. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I guess the thing for us is that uh, as a council, we're looking at contractual arrangements at the moment. Um, and uh, we're just wanting to see, or, or if you could provide us some commentary on how that meshes with that, those other procurement arrangements and changes that are occurring, that they are going to, to mesh. I mean, if I could step back a second and say, look, look, the West has been a bit of a dumping ground. Yep. Um, we've had some fires. Um, we've got um, contaminated soil being transported across. There's a lot of things that have left people in the West unhappy, people in Brimbank unhappy, and the councillors are feeling this very much um, and, under, and feel like we're under a lot of pressure in this regard from ongoing and historical circumstances. Um, but getting back to the question is, is to how is our current contract proposals going to mesh in to these changes? Uh, I think that's probably really what we yep. need advice on. So the current, um, so as part of the market sounding for the landfill procurement services, we went out to industry and said the last, as you would be aware, the last landfill contract was 10 years in tenure. And the market said, we don't want another 10 year contract. We also didn't want another 10 year contract because in four years time in the Southeast, we'll have um, advanced waste processing online. And we wanted those councils to be able to transition from uh, landfill contracts, which they're entering into to uh, the advanced waste processing contracts. Um, 
my assumption is that uh, councils in the Northwest who would also you know, like to look at their options in four years time would be able to assess that. And we've got that circuit breaker in the contract for that, for that reason. Um, and I think that that in my view is a realistic time frame to be able to look at what your options are and, and pursue those options. So you would know as that contract comes to an end in four years time where you're where you're going, you'll either be part of a procurement process or hopefully your procurement process will um, have finished and construction for a facility would be underway. Perhaps, Jill, I might just add, if I could, just to that response. Um, so what the council is currently considering um, is purely the landfill contract component. So okay. obviously, um, and Tom's going to present on this shortly, um, from our perspective, obviously, there's other opportunities through the Recycling Victoria Circular Economy Policy for us to divert uh, waste from landfill to other processes, whether it be through the FOGO service or whether it be through a new glass recycling service and also a, an enhanced, obviously, commingled service. So for over the four-year period uh, that the contract for landfill is available, it will mean that, yes, we'll need to landfill um, until well, all of that four year period, because we will always have a residual component up until an advanced waste processing facility can take that residual landfill. The trick for, for council will be is, can we implement a suite of curbside services that reduce the amount of waste that we need to send to landfill initially longer term to an advanced waste processing facility? And that's really the bit that we really need to discuss with council around the reforms around four bin, uh, four bin service and how we can look at rolling those out earlier than what the government is sort of suggested as the worst case or longest case, which sort of sort of 2030. So Tom will talk a bit more through that as part of his presentation. Um, the landfill obviously component is just the residual component if we don't divert waste at the curb to other facilities. So that's the key aspect. Thanks for that. And that's really important, Neil, because if uh, the, the focus in my view should be on, on, those, uh, on that reduction uh, not necessarily the disposal. I mean, the disposal is important, um, but that sort of, if you had to pick where you're going to focus your energy, it's sort of on that reform and ensuring that um, that's, that's implemented uh, in, my, in my view. Um, the only thing I would say, and I don't live in Brimbank, and so, um, you know, I, I do keep an eye on your issues. I noticed a number of articles in your local paper today. Um, uh, so I'm aware of uh, all the issues and, and what you've just said, Councillor Lancashire. Um, if you move to a waste energy facility, it would be out of principle, um, not necessarily out of need. And so I completely understand that. But from my lens, you'd, you'd have to decide what you wanted to do um, because you don't have that burning platform. And I understand the issues that you've had in your local area, but it's, it's a good position to be in that you don't have a landfill closing, if you like, and that you've um, you, you've got that pressure, you, you've got the opportunity to have, have a really considered approach and to be able to implement a, a strategy around that. And I think that's that's not only fiscally responsible, but, but wise, in my view. Yes, um, Councillor Papalia. Sorry, just a clarification. Um, you did mention that the um, facility was opening in say for example 2025 or 2026 and that conversations have already been in place for a three and a half year period which would that take the total lead time for something like this to about seven years is that sort of uh no no so um uh so to build to build, it depends on the facility. And they, it's, look, waste to energy is a very broad church, um, but from comparable sites that I've seen overseas for the tonnage that we're talking about in the southeast, you're looking at a minimum of a three year uh, actual construction, two and a half to three year construction. So that's after everything's been negotiated, the site has been um, identified, the planning's gone through, so realistically, you're, you know, we're actively working with the three shortlisted tenderers on the sites at the moment. So it's our intention that when we get to that contractual stage, we'll be signing in December and that they're going to be able to start construction as soon as possible because in 2025, we, 
we want to have that facility on one. But the total time frame has been about that from... Yes, no, you're right. But um, but that has... So so we did a really detailed business case in the southeast because it, because it was new. Yeah. Uh, nowhere, nowhere in Melbourne has got this technology. The second business case, which was our advice to the northwest, let's not do a business case for you. Let's do some modelling around waste and cost and you know, what will the price point be in the Northwest compared to landfill? Is that going to make financial sense? Is that going to make environmental sense? But you won't need to do a two and a half year business case, which is what we needed to do uh, for the Southeast. So no, much, much shorter. And if you, you know, that there are, there are, op there are more options in the Northwest than there are in the Southeast. No one, um, well, it's not that no one was uh, was looking at it, but certainly it was a pretty greenfields procurement at the time. Anyone else with the questions? No. All right, so we can go on to another presentation, the second one. Okay, Madam Mayor, we might um, thank Jill at this stage and. Um, uh, Riyashad as well for participating. They were, well, they'll probably leave at this point. So um, thanks, Jill, very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, appreciate that very much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks for that. And Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, I'll be departing at this point as well. So thank you. Oh, it's Kelvin. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Kelvin. See you. Thank you. See you. All right. Uh, Tom, just before you kick off, um, uh, uh, Helen, Madam Mayor, will be joining us shortly. She, uh, she because of her conflict, uh, didn't uh, participate in that first session. Um, and we'll go through, obviously, the 2.2 now, which is Tom presenting on Brimbank's uh, specific um, waste reform agenda. Uh, but, Helen, once we get to item 2.3 about landfills, Helen will need to step out of that discussion. Okay, I was going to ask that. That's great. Okay, yep. All right, so if that's okay, we, yep. might, uh, we might hand over to Tom and... Um, uh, we've got obviously a few slides to go through. Um, we'll try and do the presentation, I think, first, maybe, and then uh, perhaps take questions towards the end, if that's okay. All right, go ahead, please, Tom. Thanks, Neil. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Group Manager Operations. I look after all of Council's maintenance units. So that's me. Um, some of you will know me. Um, tonight's presentation will be on Brimbank's curbside waste and recycling collection service and the proposed transitional arrangements essentially the Recycling Victoria policy um, for bin system implementation. Um, so it'll provide an update and seek feedback from you yourselves, councillors, on the changes required to council's current curbside waste recycling collection service to transi transition into the four bin waste and recycling collection service under the same government's circular economy policy, which is entitled Recycling Victoria New Economy. It also um, emphasises the proposed implementation timeframe for the required changes to council's curbside waste and recycling services for council's consideration. We talked about the strategic directions before. These are the specific documents that influence our strategic direction. So we've got our own waste and recycling and litter strategy adopted in 2018. Um, also resulting from the recycling crisis back in 2018, we've got a national waste policy, which was released in 2018. A parliamentary inquiry was entered into in November 2019, which also influenced the changes in the reforms that we're currently proposing. And I'll mention the Recycling Victoria policy that's um, adopted in February 2020. Our own strategy looks to, um, we talked a lot about the recycling uh, diversion from landfill, and we sit currently at 41%. We're aiming to increase that, <clears throat> obviously with the Forms, um, introducing FOGO, that'll significantly go towards increasing our 41% to a significant high total, um, similar to Blue and Dara, which was, um, Councillor Tarkas mentioned about 69%. Um, in addition, it aspires to go to advanced waste technologies when they become available. Um, a key component is to introduce food organics into the curbside green organic system. And also supporting this is a well-planned um, education campaign that actually supports and issues and um, informs the residents and makes them aware of the changes and the benefits of these changes. The National Waste Policy, it sets um, banning of things going overseas. Uh, they, these include plastics, paper, glass, by mid-2020, which has already been introduced, um, and is trying to um, achieve an 80% recovery from all waste streams by 2030, which we spoke about before. 
and it's phasing out plastics by 2025, problematic plastics out of soft plastics. And moving on, these slides, Jill sort of like mentioned these, so I'll quickly run through these. There was a parliamentary inquiry, obviously as part of the SKM crisis, we looked into everything that was happening in waste specifically in Victoria, and there was a number of recommendations. Um, they included separate glass bin, um, having uniform bin lids, and also trying to achieve a certain percentage targets in um, diversion from landfill. Recycling Victoria, Jill spoke about this extensively, um, introducing a glass um, collection service, separate glass collection service by 2027, FOGO service by 2030. Again, these are not set in stone. You, we can go earlier. Um, and also an introduction, introduction of contained deposit stand by 2223. And I mentioned the big bin conformity. What that refers to is currently we've got our garbage bin and it's got a dark green lid. Um, we need to change it over to a red lid to have uh, consistency and uniformity across Victoria. So everyone's got the same colored bins and everyone's actually, when we're doing promotional advertising or um, education campaigns, everyone's talking about the same services and the same system so we can have a um, consistent message. And part of that, Jill did touch on the Waste um, Authority and Recycling Act, which will um, govern all waste legislation in Victoria once that comes into effect. There's also, Jill mentioned a number of um, funding campaigns. Currently there's one, there's a release of a $47 million um, funding for curbside reform, which we've also put in a, tra um, a funding transition plan and we're seeking to get um, some money from that to help assist us with our reform in terms of changes to our curbside recycling system or curbside waste collection services. Our current services, we've got our waste goes to clean away, the MRL side, our green waste goes to Veolia, um, and our recycling goes to clean away. It's a three bin system, and our green waste is um, voluntary and it's a user pay system. Currently our garbage is collected weekly. We, we service about over 70,000 households, fortnightly recycling. As I mentioned, it's optional user pay system for our green waste. We've got 60% take up of our, use, of our optional user pay voluntary system. That's significant. We talked about um, diverting from landfill. Well, we still got 30,000 households without a green waste bin and that basically goes to the landfill. Um, our waste services, as of last financial year, we spend about over 15, close to $15.5 million on our waste collection services. These services are recovered through what you would know as a service charge, or currently it's called the environmental charge on a rate notice, and it's subject to the size of the bin. Um, the standard bin is a 140 litre size, and you pay in, um, in the, in, as part of the environmental charge about $389. There's incentives to go for a smaller bin, which is less cost, um, but the majority of people have a 140 litre bin. We have still some two, 240 litre bins, but they're no longer available and they're not, not offered to anybody if they want a larger type bin. Our garbage collection service, just quickly, um, it services 70, close to 71,000 households. We have over four, close to 44,000 tonnes of waste or garbage goes to landfill in 2019-20. 40% of that material is organics. So it's food organics. So of the composition, if we take the organics, put it into an organic bin, which is our current green waste bin, we can divert 40% that actually goes to landfill now out of our garbage bin. And that's why Burundara and other councils that have adopted the FOGO system have got significantly higher diversion rates than what we have at the moment. Our bin size, as I mentioned them before, our current contract, which expires um, in um, April or uh, April 2000, or end of March, um, in a couple of weeks, um, it's our major contract currently with um, MRL. Our recycling service, uh, fortnightly service, 16,000 16, tonnes collected last financial year. Standard bin size, it's 240, it's collected um, fortnightly. Our contract is with CleanAway, um, expires in 2021. We've got options to extend that. We're part of a procurement process with the Metro Group. Um, it requires us to, because the procurement process with them has not been completed, um, it requires us to actually extend, potentially extend our contract with um, CleanAway for another 12 months. Uh, that's subject to a ministerial exemption, which is currently being um, processed at the moment. We're hoping to get that and we can extend another year if required. 
and hopefully hopefully we get another long-term contract out of a um, procurement collective procurement process with the metro group anyway so i mentioned it's an optional service currently servicing over 40, 42,000 households um, bin options is a 140 litre and a 240 litre and major contract is with the old you know, process the material and it goes out, out to, and they make products out of it, it goes out to the agricultural industry and other areas um, and it's, it's part of the whole process and it's a significant factor in increasing our um, recycling rate. Supported, uh, supporting all our services, our educational awareness campaigns, um, these consist of um, annual waste calendar, information on recycling bin, uh, bins, we've got decals on the waste vehicles, we've got website information, uh, we've got annual detox your home event, which is being held next week at the, at the operation centre, um, we've got a residential waste guide, it's currently been updated, we've got um, other information material, we also go out to schools um, and provide them with education uh, in terms of what our services are and the benefits of recycling. That's our diversion rate over the last, I think it's 10 years. It's gone from 39% and staggered. The reason it's staggered from 39 to 41%, we haven't embarked on that FOGO process. So once we embark on FOGO and separate um, the material that goes into your garbage bin, which is your food waste and your garden waste of those um, 30 odd thousand people who don't have a green waste bin, it's a significant amount that actually can be diverted. So we've been staggering around about the 41% mark for a number of years now. As Jill mentioned, there's a number of collective procurement um, items on at the moment. There's the residual waste, which companies are aware expires at the end of March. We've got our recycling processing service. It's in progress. Um, the interim contract for us it expires um, end of July, or it's 1st of July in 2021. We've got options to extend that. And also hopefully through the procurement process, we extend, we have a long-term contract as part of that. And she did talk about extensively about the waste, uh, advanced waste processing services. These are the recommended reforms. So compulsory food organics by 2030, separate glass by 2027, bid conformity starting now. So we've already changed over a number of bins. Our 80 litre bin lid comes with the red lid. So those, you, if you see, if you're driving around where you might have one yourself, if you've got an 80 litre um, bin, it's got a red lid. So we're trying to change the 140 litres over to red as soon as we can. And the, the, and the major change is having from the three bin system converting out to a four bin system. So what we're proposing, the existing service is currently an 80, 80 litre, 140 litre weekly residential uh, residual collection. You've got a 240 litre fortnightly co-mingle collection. You've got a fortnightly green waste and it consists of 140 litre and 240 litre. What the reforms are proposing um, for best um, adoption of the Curbside reform is a 140 litre fortnightly residual collection, a 140 litre monthly glass collection, a 240 litre fortnightly commingled collection, and a 240 litre weekly organics collection. I need to emphasise that the significant component here is that 140 litre fortnightly residual and moves away from the weekly to the fortnightly. Hobson's Bay adopted a similar system and a lot of um, there was a lot of concern with that changeover because people thought they were losing. Uh, an extra week in their collection, but they were gaining it in the weekly organics collection because that went from a fortnightly to a weekly. And that's a significant thing I need to mention. So obviously these, for the garbage service, the implications are the bid link conformity that changed over, changes over from dark green to red. And the bin size we're proposing a 140 litre. Obviously there's incentives for a smaller bin lid, which is fine. Um, Obviously, once advanced waste processing comes into effect, there'll be an alternative option for landfill, which currently it's not available. Um, as Jim, Jim mentioned, there's a number of years until that becomes a, a, a available process. And the collection frequency, I mentioned the importance of that, changing it from weekly to fortnightly. Sorry, from Sorry Tom, I might just get you to stop there. I don't know if it's your interconnection or internet connection or mine, but you are dropping out a little bit. I don't know if others are using that. So just, uh, just be careful if you can, just to try and um, uh, speak up perhaps a little bit. Thank you. Okay. All right, sorry. So recommended reform for the garbage collection and disposal. Um, bin lid conformity, change of bin lids over. It'll cost about $800,000. Um, advanced waste processing changes from landfill. Op there's an opportunities paper that the Metro's proposing, Jill mentioned that. 
Um, and she also spoke about the procurement process for that and the number of years that when that become, will become available. Um, some of the issues that the collection frequency might impact on is um, issues with odour, changing from a weekly, fortnightly, specifically nappies. That's a concern we need to uh, factor in. And also the number of the other impacts will be the number of collection vehicles and operators. Obviously, if we change from a weekly to a fortnightly, we'll reduce the numbers of vehicles and drivers required, but that'll increase in, in the organics collection. So the proposal is to have a 140 litre fortnightly um, garbage collection and have an alternative 80 litre with incentives to reduce charges. Jill mentioned about the alternative waste processing. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, it's something that's spoken about. It's extensively researched in the southeast. It's something that um, has been talked about in the west and north. However, it's not um, something that will be readily available in the next foreseeable future. And, and you know, one to two to four to five years, you, you heard this uh, um, indicative time frame. It's a long time frame before this will become a, a viable solution in the West and North. Uh, these are the rec recommended reform in the recycling um, service. So we're going from a standard 240 litre recycling bin, we're proposing a, or well, the reforms propose a, a separate glass collection bin. We're proposing a 140 litre size um, and it will be collected monthly. Complementing this will be um, the container deposit scheme, which will have a number of collection sites that um, can accept for, for, I think it's touted for about 10 cents, you can actually return these. It'll reduce the amount of litter out in the streets. Um, and also complement the service. It won't take over the service because there'll be a number of items of glass, such as wine bottles and pasta um, bottles that won't actually be acceptable at these container sites and they'll be still be required to be separated at the actual curb side. Tom, I might just stop you there. So just for one minute. So councillors, this is one of the, the sort of unknowns at this stage why uh, we'll, when we get to it in a minute, we're proposing um, to transition to the four bin system. Uh, probably in the next couple of years. Pre predominantly though, we really don't know yet what the state government's container deposit scheme looks like. Um, New South Wales have that system in place. Uh, that has been implemented over the last couple of years. South Australia have had it for many, many years, probably about 30 years. Um, but we're not quite sure and the government hasn't announced yet what that's going to be. And so therefore we're not really clear on what that means in terms of the curbside services. And so that's why we just need to be a bit careful about how early we actually consider moving to the four bin system until we really know some of those key details around the container deposit scheme. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that's clear because the four bin, the four bin, the glass bin really is kind of uh, needs to, we need to understand the container deposit scheme, which hopefully we'll know in the next 12 months uh, before we start implementing um, that process. So that's just a little bit of context for you. Sorry, Tom, happy to keep going. Thank you. Implications of the recycling service, just in summary, it requires additional bins. Um, approximately, uh, it'll cost about 500, uh, sorry, $5.2 million to actually implement a glass recycling service, just the bins alone. You need additional trucks, you need additional drivers, and we're proposing a monthly service. Yeah, we're just the main headings. And that's what I just mentioned, 140 litre monthly collection. Alternatively, um, we can consider a 240 litre option. Uh, the reason the size, you can have a larger size if people so wish, if they require it, larger families, um, larger usage of the glass, um, that, that'll be available. Because it's being recycled, it's actually been recovered. It's not an impost uh, compared to the garbage bin, which if you have a larger garbage bin, you probably tend to put more things in it and obviously it will go to landfill. So that's not proposed, we're, but we'll make available a 240 litre option for glass. Now, one of the, the contents of a glass bin, I mentioned before, the types of things that can be acceptable in, acceptable in a bin, beer, wine, they're excluded from the container deposit scheme. They'll be included in the glass bin at the current, uh, it's still being developed, but these are the things that are happening in other states, such as Adelaide and things like New, uh, you know, South Australia. They specifically restrict these type of um, glass going into the container deposit scheme, and they still require it into, into a separate glass system. Perfume bottles are not accepted. Um, 
you've got drinking glasses, there are different type of glass, um, crockery and things like that. So that all needs still to be determined. That hasn't been finalised at this point in time. Recommended reform. So the greenway service, obviously at the moment we've got a, a grass, oh, it's a, it's a green waste collection service. It doesn't include any organics. It require us to make it a, a universal service. That means that roll it out to another 28, close to 29,000 households who do not have it. So there might be con some conjecture there where people may think they don't need a bin, but because they haven't got any garden waste, they haven't got a garden, but they do have food waste. Everyone will have food waste. So it's, as part of the rollout, it'll be a universal rollout, meaning it will be a compulsory service that everyone will have. Um, we're hoping to roll this out um, at a 240 litre standard size and a weekly collection. Now, the proposal for this, Neil mentioned, we're hoping to do it by 1st of July, 2023. I know that the um, Recycling Victoria strategy looks at it by 2030, but we can, we're, we, we can actually, we've got the undertaking to make it happen by 1st of July, 2023, if council so wishes to do that. Obviously the impacts here will be we then need additional vehicles, additional operators and additional bins. And we're also proposing to hand out an um, introduction of a kitchen tidy bin. I've got a number of them in my office and I'll be handing those out as we go through the process. And we need to make a, um, you know, cons a considered decision on what type of bin tidy. And obviously we're gonna hand these out to every household um, as part of the new reform, as part of that new service. I mentioned the implications, additional bins, kitchen tidy. Um, it's a, it'll be a weekly weekly collection as opposed to the fortnightly collection that we currently experience. And we're hoping to do that by 1st of July, 2023 and uh, way before the 2030 recommended date. The options would be a 240 litre or a 140 litre alternative service option which could be also be made available. These are the kitchen tidies I was talking about. There are 15 litre, smaller type size, and they just sit in your kitchen and you and you just take the food waste, put in that, and then you transfer it into your green organics bin. Obviously, this will need to be supported by our communications plan, community engagement, to ensure people are made aware of the benefits and what the transitional arrangements are and when the collection dates have changed and um, so forth. So people have a overall understanding of why we're doing these things and, and the benefits of these new services. You mentioned, I'm, I talked about the indicative time frame. So the procurement of the waste vehicles will take us at least a year. Uh, the bins again will take us, if we start in uh, January 23, it'll take about six months to procure all the bins. Processing contract, again, Neil mentioned there's some uncertainty in the market in terms of recycling. So an earlier time frame is not recommended because of the and we're not unsure about who can uh, process glass in the market at the moment, but in 12 months' time, it will be more. We'll be more sure, and we can actually we're envisaging a you know first of, first of July 2023 a more convenient time to introduce everything because the market will be ready and it'll be a better understanding of what is available out there. And the CDS or the Container Deposit Scheme will be in effect by that stage as well. So it'll be a full understanding. And we have to recruit the drivers, it'll take a number of months, and then we're proposing the service to start 1st of July 2023. These are the indicative transitional costs. Um, garbage bin lids, I mentioned 80,000 80, bins, approximately $10, 800,000. Expansion of organics bins, 2.5 million. You've got new glass recycling bin purchase, 5.2 million. Fogo caddy purchase is about 640,000. Waste collection vehicles will need another 10. They cost around 500,000. So you're talking about 5 million outlay, but they're usually leased. So that's leased over a seven year period. Waste collection drivers will need about 10, um, approximately 85,000 salaries. So that's 850,000 uh, and that's ongoing. Customer service for six months. We're hoping to have five people on, five customer services on board. And that's to assist with the transitional arrangements. Um, last time we did a rollout, when I started in 2000, three, four, we changed over to the 240 litre recycling bins. And it took us about six months of continual phone calls, people saying, why are you introducing this? We don't need it. Um, we're good with the crates. If people remember in the bundled um, paper, um, the day we actually started the service, all those you know, concerns ceased and everyone was happy with the service. So we hope that will have similar sort of um, consequences once we introduce the reform. So we're anticipating some people ringing up and asking questions. So we'll be ready for that. 
um, so we can respond accordingly and provide them what the benefits are and what the transitions are taking place. We've got a transform recycling officer we're proposing for a three year period. That's to um, develop all the education and engagement campaigns to ensure that the change of service is understood clearly and it's um, thoroughly and uh, rolled out across the board so everyone doesn't have any um, issues with what the benefits are. And obviously local community education, that's having campaigns and education campaigns and awareness campaigns throughout where that'll, we anticipate it costs us just under a million dollars. All up the changes that are proposed will cost just over $16 million. Factors impacting an earlier commencement date rather than the 1st of July, 2023. Um, we mentioned that the market maturity is not there yet for um, glass processing. Service providers are not in the marketplace. There's only a couple. We've got Alex Fraser that puts it into road base and there's a um, uh, busy, they use it for processing as well, but it's not an extensive um, marketplace. Uh, it'll take 12 months to actually procure waste collection vehicles, minimum 12 months to deliver community engagement campaign, um, including effective lang language links. Uh, there's uncertainty in the design of the CDS at the moment um, and, lack, and combined with that is lack of confidence in the glass markets. Um, you, I mentioned the budgetary impacts, which is around about $16 million um, and also having resourcing the um, operational resources and challenge of introducing a new service um, Oh, and changing the collection frequencies, I mentioned that about if we change our garbage to from weekly to fortnightly, it'll have a lot of angst in the community and it needs to be rolled out with um, thorough um, uh, communication. Otherwise, there's, there'll be a lot of um, issues if we don't roll it out properly. The other things are impacting on it, we Jill touched on it, there's the establishment of a new waste authority and a new waste act, which is um, proposed in the next 12 months. The next steps, um, obviously there's a period of time, we've got 12 months to discuss and um, refine everything that I just mentioned for that start date of 1st of July, 2023. Um, that'll be done through briefings and also through the sustainable Green Bank portfolio. Um, and also once further, information, once further information is provided by the state government in terms of the contained deposit schemes and other available services such as AWPs once they come on board. And I'll open it up to any questions. All right, Tom, I might get you to stop sharing. And, and Madam Mayor, I, I just thought I'd um, just put a bit of a, uh, a full stop to the presentation. That's a huge amount of information to take in for councillors, obviously, yeah. um, you know, um, in terms of um, what's the current services. So just understanding what we currently do and then looking at what does what's required essentially for us to transition to what um, the state government has proposed is the the best services to offer into the future, that four bin system. You know, they've set quite long lead times, 2030, I think all up to have those reforms implemented. Um, we're conscious that councillors uh, are very keen to see us look at the diversion of waste from landfill and try and deal with that much sooner than 2030, I think. Um, and so we're saying that, look, we think hopefully, subject to what happens probably in the next six to 12 months, um, from the state government around, particularly around the container deposit scheme and a number of other processes that they're working through, that we could work towards a 1 July 2023 rollout of that four bin system, which will increase Brimbank's diversion rate from the current 42% dramatically up to around that sort of 70, sort of 75, 80% um, potentially. But there is a lot more work to do. Um, we obviously need to do a bit more analysis around what that would look like. Um, and I hope you do realise that there is obviously significant costs associated with that uh, rollout. We'd like to do some, uh, some testing um, the model with some of our community members to get a feel for, for what that new service would look like. There will be, as Tom said, some concerns around moving a weekly garbage to fortnightly um, and people having to obviously use a organics bin for the first time in Brimbank. So there, it is something that has happened in other areas, not widespread at this stage. Um, so I think it's just worth making a note that there are opportunities for Brimbank to look at increasing its diversion, uh, but we just need to make sure we understand all the implications and the costs before we come to council formally to seek your, uh, your resolution around rolling out that four bin system. So I just wanted to put it at that point, uh, and then I'll hand back to you, Madam Mayor, to, uh, to manage the questions.
Madam Mayor, I think you're on mute. Yep. Yes, Councillor Lancashire. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, look, having been on the Raven Hall Committee and the Metro Waste Committee, um, uh, look, uh, I've probably got to make some statements about um, what I've seen. And uh, I'm, you know, unashamedly a big fan of FOGO. Um, and I'll just briefly say that the idea of getting your putrescible kitchen scraps into a bin tidy and uh, the type of bag you have there is 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 not a plastic bag it's it's a biodegradable bag so you put your kitchen waste into that it goes into the green bin i've been out to the plant where they process that and make the most amazing mulch for farms and other uses it's brilliant um and i'm um, certainly uh the idea of um keeping putrescible waste out of um, streams like, for example, Ravenhall and reducing smells from tips because it all goes to this far away plant where it's produced, um, where you produce the, uh, um, uh, the mulch. Now, the government proposal to do that by 2030 is probably one of the things I don't like. Um, the proposal we have to go early for this scheme by 2023 um, I'm very convinced that that's a really good idea. Um, this is not the sort of waste that would go or, or should be going to one of those $400 million plants, or it's not the sort of waste that should be burnt. Uh, this is the sort of uh, waste that should be producing a really productive mulch, um, as we're already doing, but adding, adding to it things like kitchen scraps, putrescible waste and things like that is really good. So in that regard, uh, I see um, uh, the, the state government proposal too long. I see what we're doing in that area as being excellent and well-timed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry, uh, thanks, Councillor Lakes. I really appreciate those comments. And what, it's really interesting. One of, the, one of the things that's still out a little bit in terms of um, the FOGO service is that um, some processes um, request that you that you don't actually put the the uh, the food waste into a into a compostable bag. I know some do, which you're quite right. You've as you've seen through your role uh, on the Metro Waste Group. Um, there, so that's exactly an example where there is still a bit of you know clarity for us to work through about whether in fact cost, compostable bags can be used or whether in fact the the organic material needs to go loose into the green bin. And look, um, I've been trialling that at my premises at the moment uh, in a, an adjoining municipality in Maribyrnong. And it, it does have its challenges. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the Maribyrnong Council is still collecting the green waste fortnightly. And uh, so that is problematic in putting food waste in that bin. And that's one of the reasons you really need to look at moving it to weekly. But the issue of compostable bags is still a bit of a contentious issue and one we're gonna have to work through in the longer term of how we manage that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Papalia. Thank you. Sorry, just um, with the green waste, when we say green waste, uh, sorry, food waste, is that cooked food waste and all food waste or is it just kitchen scraps from vegetables or it's all food waste? waste. All food. We're planning all food waste. They can accept it. The Olea can accept all food waste. Literally. Yeah, it's an universal processing system where it goes, it heats it up to 60 degrees. Council Lancashire has been at the sign and it comes out as a costing type of product. Um, <laughs> all food waste. Awesome, thank you for that, Tom. And so, Neil, in Maribyrnong, you're doing that with the food waste? Yeah. Weeks? And I've got to be honest, because it's only a fortnightly fortnightly collection still, essentially what, what Maribyrnong have, have, have trialled with a few residents is um, that you can put um, food scraps into your green waste bin, uh, but it is only collected fortnightly. So I'll be honest, I don't put anything that is you know quite quite uh, quite onerous into the green bin because by the time you get round to your fortnightly collection, you know you've got uh, a whole range of issues whether it be you know flies and smells and whatnot. So so the, the service the critical part of the organic service of putting food in with green waste is it really does need to move to a weekly collection. Yeah, because that was my concern around rodents and yeah and so and and the challenge for that of course is if you keep picking up the garbage weekly residents won't use the organic bin service to the full effect and so you'll end up not actually achieving the diversion rates 
that you really want to achieve by that FOGO service. Councillor Langshi's points are very valid uh, in terms of the FOGO is a really good opportunity for us to divert organic material away from landfill. Uh, and I know there's a lot of concerns about the use of landfills into the future, but if we can avoid the amount of waste that we need to send to landfill, and by sending it to obviously a composting facility in the FOGO case, uh, in glass, if we can send it to a, grass, a glass processor, you know, it will reduce the amount of waste we have to send to landfill down dramatically. And over longer term, that will be actually more economical as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor um, David had a hand twice already. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just, I was very surprised <clears throat> to see so many um, coloured uh, bins tonight. Uh, in early days, we thought that maybe the green waste in that of uh, the food waste might go into the one bin. But um, I, I saw different tonight and I heard a lot of um, good stories. Um, previous um, uh, presenter, it, um, it did um, spoke well in, in reference to tomorrow thinking, which is uh, good. And I hope to God that um, the, West, the Northwestern region might start somewhere like that in the near future. Now, we've got lots and lots of different people in our society. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, they keep bringing me all the time while you're having the meeting. Sorry about that. Yes, so we've got a single person, an oh, old lady that hardly puts any rubbish out at all. Now, how come we forced that lady with a, a 140 litre bean and things as such? Um, it'd be a lot of sort of, um, uh, and as Neil said, it was going to take a long time before we can try and digest that to people what we're doing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Neil. You've got to say something. I, oh, yeah. yeah, certainly. Look, thanks, Kent. David, you, you make you know you make some incredibly important points, and, and one of the reasons that we're saying to council at this stage we wouldn't recommend rushing into implementing um, these yeah. changes in the next say twelve months. We, well, we can't probably physically do that anyway. But yeah. but in terms of uh, all the the requirements, but there is a lot of work to be done about educating our community around the new service, and we'll have we will have to put some serious money. Uh, towards that process <clears throat> and the problem with having a service that is what we call a universal service a service that essentially everybody gets it's not going to suit everybody quite the same I right. mean, yeah. one person household with four bins out the front is ridiculous in a sense <laughs> but ultimately um, uh, we are hoping that that bin system the four bin system will suit you know the majority of households in terms of them being able to really make a difference in diverting their waste from landfills so We'll have to try and balance that as best we can. Um, the nature of council providing a, a generic service, you know, uh, a waste service is that there will be someone, some people that, you know, are paying for a service that they won't utilise as much as another household. Um, there'll be other households that actually need more bins uh, within that service because they generate more waste. And unfortunately, it's the same situation we have now, Councillor David, where mm. some residents pay for 140 litre garbage collection per week and maybe only fill up one little bag. Um, yeah, that's unfortunately, true. that is the nature of a universal service. And if you try mm. and have too many options and too many different uh, sizes of bins, it becomes almost impossible to manage. Um, and you lose a lot of your efficiencies in the way you provide the service. But they're very good points, Councillor David. We're going to have to think about all of those when we communicate the changes, um, particularly those changes around the garbage bin, which we know are going to be problematic you know, councillors, once we roll this out, if you agree and you resolve to do that, you'll get a lot of calls in that transition period. Very much indeed, yeah. yeah. And what we'll try and do, and the reason we need, you know, a really good lead time is to make sure that when we do transition the services, we put a lot of effort up front into the communications, in the education. We'll have, you know, people in shopping centres, we'll have people, uh, you know, at various mm. community groups talking to people about the new four bin system that's coming. Um, mm. The only way really to stop sort of people um, not using the service and, and revolting, if I can say, will be if we don't put the effort in up the front to the communication uh, and customer sort of liaison process. So, I mean, look, you know, maybe just as a recent example, uh, councillors will be aware that we changed our hardway service uh, in, uh, in the last couple of years. We did that where we considered the, uh, the change in service. Uh, and we made sure we put a lot of effort into communicating that well in advance of the change. And to be honest, it was an incredibly successful change 
in the way that we rolled out that service because of the effort we put in. Front. And so that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying to councillors, you know, there is a big decision to be made, not, not, not in the next little while, not in the next probably six months, but we will come to council towards the end of this year, uh, you know, to give you an update and to probably seek some direction about whether we go forward with this dramatic change in that one July 2023 period. It will mm -hmm. be dependent on a number of factors uh, through the state government, but um, there is a lot of work to do to make sure that we do roll out a successful service. And the other point, uh, I saw my friend uh, Tom showing us so many different bottles there, glass. Um, what am I going to do with my whiskey bottles, Tom, and things as such? That goes in your glass bin um, conveniently at home. So that's a separate glass collection service. It's usually the containers, you know, you've got your Coke bottles and your cans. They're the things that are, that are usually in the public mm -hmm. realm. Has thrown out as litter. Now, the beauty of the container deposit scheme will all those things that kids and others will collect them because they actually you get money for them. You get 10 cents per container. So you won't see as much litter out there. That's the benefit. But having said that, there's the <coughs> of it. You know, you've got your, um, as you mentioned, your whiskey bottles, your wine bottles, and your your pasta, mm -hmm. you know, containers and things or pasta sauce containers and things like that, that will be required to put into the separate glass bin from the household. So at, at the moment, I did mention it hasn't been totally defined, but at the moment, that's what we're reading into it, and that's what's been implemented in other areas across uh, across Australia. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Mayor, if there's no other questions, I, I might just... Um, yes, that. actually, um, I had um, Councillor Tackles before. I don't know if she wants to go ahead, and then I've got a uh, Councillor Bork as well. Okay, thank you. And then <laughs> Councillor Newen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, with the education side of it, Tom, um, are we going to actually also perhaps do some online training for people on things like composting? Because I notice other councils are putting these information sessions on and they're gaining a lot of popularity where a lot of people can reduce their waste footprint already before we roll this out. So. Um, I'm thinking if we do composting, um, if we do worm farming, if we do alternatives um, so that people are starting to look at splitting up their waste because hitting them with, <coughs> okay, you're going to do this separate and this separate is a big change for a lot of our community. But if we start saying, look, what, what can you reduce now? And composting is, I know a lot of Europeans do it because they've been doing it for years, but also a lot of people, it's trendy now to create their own compost. And when they're getting their grass cuttings, especially instead of dumping them in um, green bins, they can co turn it into compost and uh, use it for their gardens. So how about we start educating from now and maybe put, one or two, because we're doing the pop-up waste thing, which is really good. And we're really hammering home the, um, the Keelor Park Depot, which is really good. So we're getting those ideas in head, but just a couple of classes, education about what can you do at home as well? Okay. Brilliant, no, that's brilliant. Um, and we do have that, the Environment Department do roll out those programs. We have got some programs in place. I'm not totally across those, but I know they're rolled out from a different department than mine. Um, and I do understand totally. My mother-in-law told me no more bins. She composts everything. So <laughs> I know exactly where you're coming from. Yet we invented it. Yes. Just sorry, Tom. Just 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 to provide a bit of extra detail, Councillor Tuckers, you're absolutely right. I mean, self-sustainability would be the ultimate uh, outcome, really, for people actually managing their own waste. Uh, and you will get you know people who are interested to do a part of that, but it won't unfortunately you know, pick up the, the bulk of the food waste that's uh, that's currently going to landfill. Your 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 point about the home composting online sessions. So last year, because of COVID, um, the environment team did a number of online sessions around a whole range of environment issues, and they were incredibly well subscribed. So they were really popular. And the other thing that you might remember, Council Tarkos, was the council um, agreed um, uh, in the last term to roll out the home composting uh, program where we support uh, essentially people to home compost that has been so well subscribed um, and the environment department has you know been you know quite surprised about the number of people who have taken it up so we'll continue to promote that uh, and we'll continue to roll that out so that's already happening essentially um, based on um, decisions um, in the last council do we offer subsidized compost bins still or not well essentially the program that we promote 
provides very, very affordable compost uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, as well as all the you know, resourcing around helping people getting going. So okay. it's actually been a very worthwhile program. As I said, you know, I think last year it was like a thousand compost uh, you know, uh, applications went through. Uh, and, you know, because the actual company actually delivers it uh, and then helps them set it up in a sense of providing them all the information and a dedicated website. So um, I'm happy to get Matt from our environment team to give councillors a bit more information about that, uh, maybe in, a, in, in, a, in an upcoming council information bulletin. Just an idea for the mayor, perhaps we can all get uh, a compost bin as councillors and show, lead by example, for example, like that we can do it, um, other people can cotton onto it. <laughs> Just an idea. Oh, I think well, I was thinking about that when he came with the screen of the picture of different bins. So I think we should do something like that to try it. So, you know, not to preach something that we don't have idea about. So um, I think it would be great. And when you, um, uh, 15 years ago in Germany and Aldi, you have the, I've seen vending machine when you put your bottles and you get money back for it. So we are really behind. Anyways, um, Victoria, Councillor Bork had her hand up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, like uh, like, uh, like Councillor David, I do express concern regarding um, uh, the community transitioning to this new service. I must admit, when I, uh, when I saw the figures of 60% uh, of the households only have a green bin, that sort of alerted me quite uh, a bit, you know, but um, I suppose we need to put in a lot of education into this uh, before we get to the transition part of it. And I'm sure council will take care of that. I'm like uh, Neil said earlier with regards to the uh, uh, transitioning to the um, from the system that we had before with regards to the hard uh, collection to the new one that uh, went very, very smoothly, you know, overall. So um, I'm pretty sure council will be uh, uh, managing, managing that very well. My query is how much would it cost to the um, uh, residents, to the households um, with regards to the new system? Yeah, look, thanks Councillor Borg. It certainly will be something that we'll have to come back uh, to council with in more detail. Tonight was really just providing an overview of what's proposed and sort of some indicative timelines. I mean, that 1 July 23 is, is really probably the earliest we can go yeah. at this stage, yeah. but we will come back with more details around what the cost impact will be going forward. Um, <clears throat> it is a little bit unknown because of yeah. costs associated with some of the processing of those materials, uh, but we'll be able to do some pretty good cost benefit analysis around what it will cost. It's worth noting that um, the government has flagged that it will be increasing what's called the landfill levy on every tonne of waste that goes to landfill mm -hmm. uh, over the next couple of years. So, so in terms of the cost benefit, notwithstanding obviously the environmental benefits of diverting it away waste from landfill, there will be ultimately probably an economic benefit to do so as well. Um, and so we'll obviously come back and give you some figures around what indicatively it'll mean for each household in terms of the cost per uh, year for that service. Thanks for that, thank you. And just uh, uh, in addition to that, there's also funding programs which actually support that. So it won't be one big upfront cost. It'll be, like I mentioned, the trucks will be transitioned over a seven year lease period. So that reduces the cost of you know, one year impact and also the funding that we're hoping to secure, which will reduce those costs even further. Councillor Nguyen, did you, yeah. Yeah, um, so there's this four bin program just for residential houses. How about um, rubbish in commercial areas? Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Councillor Nguyen. Look, at this stage, um, Brimbank and, and most other councils don't provide um, curbside uh, services to the commercial sector. And look, one of the reasons for that is, and it's a bit, a bit similar to Councillor David's question before, you know, obviously the residential sector, we've pretty much got um, a, a clear base, you know, each household's quite similar. You do have obviously uh, larger and smaller families and you've got units and houses, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a fairly similar market. So you can provide what we call a universal service um, that majority of people will be comfortable with. In the, in the commercial and industrial area where you've got businesses that have a whole range of different waste and resource recovery needs, it's very hard to provide a service for those that's kind of a universal service. 
So often we've said, look, rather than council charging businesses for a service that they might not need or they need a much a greater service, um, that we're better off letting those businesses actually go to the private market and, and actually procure those services themselves. Um, so look, that's got, that's got some issues with it because it generally means that the market's behind where councils have been in terms of resource recovery. So often they'll provide a, a landfill bin only. They won't provide necessarily whether it's you know, cardboard recycling or bottles and cans, because it's, it's probably economical in a sense, just to put it all in the one bin and send it to landfill. That will certainly change over time with the increase in landfill costs. And I think there will be a number of uh, businesses that will certainly look to service the, the small business market for their resource recovery needs. But it's something that council hasn't done to date and most councils don't do just because it's such a variety of different businesses that you would need to service. Um, for example, you might have a milk bar that has basically very small uh, uh, waste output versus a restaurant that has a high organic output. Um, and so therefore you've got to really kind of balance what is the service that council can really assist with. And to date, that's not something that councils have entered into. Is that something that the state government will probably regulate in the future then? Yeah. <clears throat> I think so. I mean, I certainly, I think from the government's perspective, they're, they're really trying to signal to the marketplace, you know, that by increasing the cost of landfill through artificially inflating landfill with the landfill levy, that it'll make it much more economic for businesses, you know, even small traders to look at how they can divert their own waste. And that, look, that's the case now. There are a lot of businesses that do some really good things around diverting their waste. Um, we're actually doing a bit of a pilot uh, with uh, a number of our uh, uh, business associations that are looking at, you know, is there an option to look at a, you know, a collaborative sort of approach for resource recovery, in, in, particularly in some of our major activity centres. But at this stage, um, we wouldn't be looking to provide a universal service for the, for the business sector because it's just too varied uh, for us to be able to provide that universal service. Oh, thank you. Any more questions? councillors? No? Okay, we can go on to the next one. My computer is off, sorry. Right, can um, you just... Mayor, I think Helen will uh, zoom out for this component. So, um, as she has got a conflict in relation to... Bye, Helen. Bye, everyone. Good night, sleep well, all those things. Okay, Madam Mayor, so really this item was just popped on the agenda, um, given that uh, there was a request from councils just to have a, a time for a bit more discussion about the uh, confidential landfill services contract. So uh, I wasn't going to present, uh, it was really just almost a Q&A session. Um, Tom will stay here because he's, uh, he's obviously got some expertise in that area as well. So we're happy to, to really just take questions, um, which obviously I think the special council meeting to consider the report has been set for next Tuesday. Um, and so obviously as many questions or comments uh, tonight would be very useful for councillors to help inform themselves. Um, and that way, um, yeah, we can obviously have the matter considered formally at the council meeting next week. So over to you, Madam Mayor, for any questions. All right, I do have a lot of questions, but whoever wants to go first, or so do you want me to go first with the questions? All right, I will. Okay, my first question is, how many landfills do we have in um, Brimbank? Um, I know a few, but um, I know about Water Gardens, the, the car park, and um, the, um, the, I don't know if it's under Albion or, it's a Carrington Street one. Is it Albion or Sunshine, that one? Um, and with, how many, do we know how many do we have in our, in our municipality? Uh no, look, I don't have the exact number, but in terms of landfills that are operating, um, in other words, still receiving waste, um, my understanding it's really only um, Kioba landfill, um, which is what they call an, uh, supposedly an inert landfill. So they don't accept household garbage. Uh, they accept inert material. Um, I say that in inverted commas, because um, you know who knows what goes in there, to be honest, as councillors would know, but that's their license is for an inert landfill. 
Um, Tom, I'm unaware of any other operating landfills in Brimbank. Um, no, I just want to know about steel because two of them that I mentioned, they are steel ones. So I just oh, want to so know how many we had in the past, like what oh. we went through in the past, how many steel oh, ones so we closed, had. So landfills that have been closed and have been yeah. re rehabilitated, you know. Yes, staffed. steel ones, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. Who knows? There's yeah, there's about, no, I've seen, I used to look after um, a number of former landfill sites. You've got one at Green Gully. The former hill fill, you've got the one at Sunshine, which is you mentioned Carrington, but that goes across the ring road. So some of it's on the you know, south side, some of it's on the north side. Um, so that's just one. It's the former Sunshine landfill. You got the Brooklyn site, which is accepting recyclable material. That's um, clean away. You mentioned the Sydney one. That's like a contaminated site. So there was um, we look after that in terms of monitoring the groundwater and any uh, missions that come the out. Car park one. Yeah, that's the car park one near the, the water gardens. Yeah. So they're the former landfill sites. I used to look after them. Now it's looked after by the environment department. So yeah, we've got environmental pans on those that they requires us to monitor them ongoing. Um, so yeah, they're the, they're the closed ones, the former landfill sites. So we don't have an active one in- What about the Can Canley? Uh, what about Canley? They've got one still one too, isn't it? Uh, Canley um, wasn't really a landfill. It was more- Oh mate, no, that's, that's you're, oh, you're talking about the mound? That was the material, so it had a lot of material that was- Oh, um, that was ammunition, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was-, it was It's still rubbish that was for Yeah, the ammunition yeah, yeah, the ammunition site. So they got all that contaminated material and they placed it as a mound and, they yeah. it, and that's where the flags are near the ring road. Yeah. That's the site you're talking, that, that you mentioned. We, we don't manage that site, that's managed- no, by yeah. Do we have any more of those? No, the ones I mentioned, they're the sites that we have. That are oh, no, no, I just want to know for- because um, it's been, we, we have a contaminated land management officer. Sorry, I lost you there. Yeah, that's yeah. Ranka. You're getting a bit hard to hear. Your internet connection is not great. Did you want to just perhaps to try and improve your connection, maybe turn off your camera just so we can hear you a little more clearly? Just see if that no, works. No, that's your faces. <laughs> Yeah, you, really, we can't okay. hear anything. I can't hear what uh, the, the mayor is saying myself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's yes, better, yeah. Mayor. That's much I'm better. I'm going to come very close to the... Um, that's the much better. ...iPad. Um, the, the, can we talk figures as well? I'm allowed to talk because, yeah, it's yep. confidential. We all hear that. Yeah, is that all yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, now's the time. Okay. Um, yeah, right now. Okay, beautiful. Um, what I'm, what my concern is why I ask how many still we have is because we had so many in past and um, we are trying to stop all this from uh, Kelba from everywhere. And now uh, signing contract of four years, it's contradicting ourselves. So my concern is when some initiative comes from government, they're not going to take us seriously because here we off signing something that um, uh, it's going for four years. I know that can't be changed, but can be looked at um, uh, one year rather than four years. And then everyone is gonna take us more seriously because um, if you sign something off for four years, I'm, I'm sure government is not gonna look at us seriously when initiative um, energy to waste comes or anything like that. So the other concern is so many sealed landfills, whatever it is, it's contem a contaminated um, a land look after. The other concern is um, we were trying to um, say, you know, stop the soil, stop this, but yet we're signing off this. So again, we're contradicting ourselves. The other thing is, um, I spoke to Neil, over four years, we have a 8,728,47 columns, uh, which makes for one year $2,182.11. So that's for four year contract. We're gonna pay um, $549,263, which if we sign for one year, single year, will end up costing us, which I counted, Correct me if I'm wrong. One thousand one hundred thirty-seven thousand thirty-one cent, which I counted will be fifteen point nine percent. So, um, if we do that in that one year, we're going to be paying extra fifteen point nine percent. If we saving the uh, if 
do pay in that one year 15.9%, uh, we may save much more when initiatives come our way because they're against dumping rubbish. That's why I asked that lady before, where they're going to dump their rubbish? Why they first looked at, yes, because, you know, they don't have any more space, but they're going to dump our way anyway. So, like, it just... I never understand, as I mentioned when we spoke to um, Mr. What was his name? Um, hello, hello, is it hello? Oh yes, Andrew. Um, yep. Um, I, yeah, I mentioned then. Um, if, you know, I said every life matters, uh, which is not just black life. Which just comparing to Turak or some areas that never have this issue, and us, our people suffer from asthma, from smell. Why other people don't suffer? Because they don't have the landfills. They don't have that issue. So my concern with all this is, when will we put stop to it? When do we do something as a council? I know it's a hard work, especially for you guys, redoing all this contract, doing all this work all over again. I totally understand that. But again, we have to think of our municipality very hard as well. And I'm here, I'm not trying to be hard on any of us here. I'm just trying to open my eyes, first of all. Okay, what do we have in front of us? And that's why I was a little bit concern because we had this contract just put in front of us in a short period of time. My concern is why all those big contracts come back to it? Why we don't have a time to think about it? It's just like, I feel it's just dropped in front of us and it's like, oh my God, what do we do with this? Yep. It is a big contract. It is a lot sure. of money and I do have a big concern. Okay, th thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, you are dropping in in and out a little bit, but I'll um I'll try and provide a response. And look, ultimately, yes, um, the it's not ideal timing in terms of uh, having to consider this contract right early in the term of council. But unfortunately, the nature of when the contracts current contracts end is that it does conclude on the thirty first of March this year. And so, while our preference would have been to obviously briefed you you know, towards the end of last year. Unfortunately, we only got the final information and the final evaluation reports from the Metro Group late uh, sort of last year, which has obviously then precluded the ability for us to have those discussions earlier. Notwithstanding that, um, I completely understand all the things that you've said and that you're all very valid points around the concerns around landfilling into the future. What this contract essentially is seeking is uh, the ability for us to continue to be able to provide our current garbage service to the residents and have a facility where we can take that waste uh, into the next four years, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the contract term. Um, the contract does provide options to either guarantee the waste uh, for the next four years, which was the officer recommendation. It does have an option to only guarantee it for a year by year for the next four years, or it in fact has an option not to guarantee any waste at all. And essentially what that means is there's different rates um, that, the, that the contract enables, which means that if you are not guaranteeing the waste, you will pay a higher rate. If, you know, from my perspective- um, some I understand that I said, if we do have a one year, one by one year guarantee, sure. it's 15.9% a year, but yeah. we do, do we still have an option if something better comes our yeah. way. And so for example, it, it, you know, if we talk about the presentation that we just had from Tom, where we're looking at potentially rolling out, you know, the four bin system, which will which will dramatically divert the amount of waste we have to send to landfill. Um, even if even if council had resolved the four year guaranteed landfill rate, we would still only be delivering to the landfill the amount of waste that we need to deliver. It wouldn't actually be uh, guaranteeing the waste that we're delivering in the first year or two. It would be the the amount of waste or be a less amount because we would divert other waste to, to an organics processing facility and to a glass recycling facility. The reality is we will need landfill um, of in, in the next four years, definitely, and I, and I think even longer. Um, we heard from Jill about the timelines to develop an, a, an advanced waste processing facility is well beyond that four year period. So really, um, council does have the option, absolutely, Madam Mayor, to only go year by year and we pay a little bit more for not committing the full four year. And that's certainly an option available to council. Um, alternatively, you know, you can go for a four year commitment 
knowing that we'll only be delivering the waste on that guarantee of the waste that we have in what's left in the garbage bin. If we divert waste within the next couple of years to some other facility, you obviously won't be paying for that waste component. Does that make sense? Yeah, to me, it does make sense. Um, yes, so you've got that option available. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other councillors with questions? Councillor Lancashire had his hand up. You're on You're mute, Councillor Lancashire. Mute. The blessed mute. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Look, I, I just to clarify the, the those the two options of four year or a year by year by year by year for the four years. Just just to get it clear, what's the difference in cost for let, let's let's say um, uh, if we annual cost if we go the four year or the annual cost if if we do it year by year what's the difference um yeah so the, the difference I didn't, I didn't pick it up before sorry yeah, so, so the difference um is, is essentially about half a million dollars so as, as as the mayor said it's about one hundred and thirty thousand per annum to to essentially have that ability for us to have flexibility about sending our waste somewhere else and to be honest if i thought there would be an alternative waste processing facility in the next four years available to, to Brimbank Council, I would recommend doing the year by year because we would want to keep our options open. Um, the reality is I don't think, um, and you know, the industry experts are telling me that there won't be an alternative to landfill for us to use in the next four years. And that's why the officer recommendation recommended guaranteeing for four years. Now look, who knows, something could happen and something could miraculously be developed um, within that shorter four year period. Um, I doubt it, but it could. And so that's why I think council does have the option only to go year by year. Uh, but that will come at an impost of about half a million dollars over that four year term or 130,000 per annum as the mayor mentioned. Councillor mm -hmm. uh, Papalia. Thank you. So um, Raka mentioned before that um, the, the Southeast is, um, putting their waste in, in the West. However, in the presentation, um, Jill mentioned that the Southeast have their own waste facility that they use. Um, but the reason that the attention is there is because it's it will be full soon and potential that it will need to divert to the West or the North or wherever else in Melbourne. But I just wanted to confirm currently that waste is not going to our landfills. And this discussion is only about Brimbank and our waste, which is the only council, like is that, does the whole of Melbourne go to us or does it? So, so she said I, they waste goes occasionally to us. That's what she actually, that was her words. They waste occasionally goes to, to our sides. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just, I'll just provide some details on that. Um, Sorry? I'll just provide some details and respond to that if I can. Um, so, so essentially what happens is there is the Suez landfill in Hampton Park, as Jill mentioned, which has about, you know, four, I think she said about five years worth of capacity left before it's completely full. Um, so Suez certainly do take a lot of the waste from the southeast. There is also um, other uh, organisations, other competitors to Suez, such as CleanAway and such as um, uh, Citywide and a few other waste providers who actually operate what they call uh, transfer stations where they will take a lot of the waste from the, the residential garbage trucks and then they'll put it into a big compacting truck and then they will find the best possible landfill that suits their needs in terms of cost. So it might well be that those larger trucks that where they've aggregated the waste travel either to the north, to the Willert landfill in the northern suburbs, or definitely over into the Melbourne Regional Landfill in Ravenhall, or potentially even to the landfill in West Roads in Werribee. So there is, an, there is waste coming from the east and the southeast to the west and to the north. And that's essentially kind of a, a cost benefit exercise where in some cases, because the landfill is so short in the southeast, they charge a lot more money to deposit the landfill there. So some, some people will actually transport it 
across to the north and to the west because it's more affordable and it stacks up to transport it. So there is a bit of that happening already and that will happen more so once that landfill closes if that advanced waste processing facility is not established to enable to service those councils in the southeast. And sorry, just one last question to sure. add. I just want to be really clear that this contract that we're talking about has no difference to all of the other councils currently using the landfill site with the contract that the contract is being discussed for. Sorry, I'm not quite sure of the question. Can you just repeat sorry. that? So what I'm trying to ask is all of the other, the rest of Melbourne that does use that facility, our decision on a contract extension for four years of one year, 12 months, it will not impact anyone else's decisions. No. That's already, yeah. No. Thank so you. even though the Metro Waste and Resource Recovery Group have done what they call a collective procurement process um, for on behalf of all the councils that are participating, ultimately it's up to each individual council to choose where they send it, so which landfill, and on what rate you select, whether it's a guaranteed rate, either be for four years or just year by year over that four years, or a non-guaranteed rate over that four year. So really the options for council are, we, we have to accept a four year contract and, and we need to, because we're going to need landfill into the future. Even if we implement the four bin system earlier than that four years, we will still have a residual component, a garbage bin that we need to send that waste somewhere. So we will need landfill definitely in the next four years because it's very unlikely there'll be an alternative to landfill within a four year period. Really the debate and the discussion as I understand it, the council are having is if we guarantee for four years, does that you know, inhibit our ability to look at taking that waste to a, uh, an advanced waste processing facility? And a four year guarantee, yes, it does. But the reality is there won't be probably one available anyway. So that's really the considerations councillors have to make. Councillor Tarkos. Um, yeah, just two, two questions. One, the first one is um, the option of the gasification. I remember going to the actual uh, presentation day of the waste to energy out in Wyndham, and they said that they were progressing their case for um, possibility of opening the that that um, and I'm not saying that that's going to be the answer either. All I'm asking is, um, at the time they were saying they were looking at getting the EPA license uh, to to go ahead with it, and that we were also going to set up a waste facility. Can I ask, firstly, that question? Yeah. So, uh, so um, the one of the are you talking about the site in Laverton? They're proposing to set up a waste energy facility. Laverton. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Laverton. So, so um, the Laverton site, which is the the um, the gentleman that uh, actually emailed all of the councillors uh, on that uh, Saturday before the council meeting, uh, a, a chap called Craig Ayers, um, who I think was essentially trying to suggest that council's going to be you know having fires and uh, you know doing the wrong thing if we lock into a four year guaranteed process. Um, it, it was totally inappropriate for him to do so because he he's, he was his company is part of the tender process for landfill, so he essentially was canvassing councillors totally inappropriately. The assessment that we made, and it's all in the in the confidential attachment um, to the council report, so have a have a good look through that. But essentially, the assessment that the Metro Waste Group made and council officers made is that that facility um, is hasn't even hasn't even actually got the necessary regulatory. Uh, permits enabling it to proceed and it hasn't even started construction so I think you would have heard Jill say that look at at a minimum you're talking three years really for construction of these facilities um, and we would also have to go through a procurement process to enable council to actually use that facility we can't suddenly just decide to send um, our waste to that facility without going through a procurement process and from my perspective waste to energy is certainly a viable option in terms of advanced waste processing, but it's not the only option. And it does have its own complications. I mean, essentially what you're doing is in incinerating waste um, to create energy. So it means you're, you're actually not being able to reuse um, some of that material that you could otherwise potentially treat for beneficial use. Um, it also does have a, a component of material that comes out the end, what the ash, uh, after you burn the material, that has to also be landfilled. So at the end of the day, there'll always still be some need for landfill um, and there will be uh, opportunities for us to look at these technologies into the future. But our assessment as officers is 
there won't be a facility available within the next four years that will enable us to be able to take our landfill component to it. Um, but I understand that council or councillors might want to have an option to be able to do that within the four years. And that's why the one year, one year, one year, one year component is available, but it does come at a cost impost um, as we've already spoken about. Okay. Um, the second part of my question is um, the landfill levy that we pay um, is going to double and um, that landfill levy, uh, can I just explain to the new councillors, we've been paying it for decades mm. and it's millions of dollars that goes to the <coughs> government where the government has uh, said that, it, uh, you know, and the EPA governor and the, it goes into the sustainability fund and that money is meant to come back to communities in the form of um, recycling, um, industries, um, you know, all kinds of projects of which Brimbank has seen nothing absolutely nothing so one thing that i want to put into um as a kind of a you know idea for uh, a norm is that we do the right thing we end up being the the carriers of victoria's waste and we get no value out of the the, the landfill levy that we're paying that's going to double you know in the next two year, two or three years so i think I have a sense that our community is looking to us and I'm really angry that we have to lock ourselves into a four year contract because this government, this state government has done nothing innovative with waste and is now expecting us to say, well, you've got to look at sustainability, you've got to look at all these things. We've got nowhere else, no other options to put our waste except to landfill it, which affects us in the end. You know, because we're the ones that have got the big landfills still next to us and operating. And that's what makes me upset. And I think the perception out in the community is, oh, thanks, councillors, for locking us into an... You're saying, you know, climate emergency, reduce emissions. We're doing all the right thing, providing the government with all this tax and levy. And not one cent of it is coming back to us in innovative... So I think we need to hit the government up for options because... We can't, as a council, create industries that recycle glass and plastics. That is the role of the government. And that is the role of the minister who should be putting that money from the landfill levy, the millions of dollars that is sitting in consolidated revenue, back into our community and setting up industries that can recycle glass, recycle plastics. That should all be coming back to us. Yeah, look, Councillor Tarkas, your, your comments are absolutely spot on. I mean, the, the landfill levy has been... Uh, has been uh, put in place essentially to try and encourage uh, alternatives to landfill, you know, to make it more cost competitive for advanced waste processing facilities. And that certainly will be the case in a couple of years time. But, but the issue I suppose at hand is that all councils, not just bring back all councils, unfortunately have to landfill their waste uh, in the next, you know, probably four years is my estimate at minimum. Uh, the Southeast will potentially have an option beyond that. Um, and really what council needs to decide in relation to this contract is, we don't have to lock in for a four year guaranteed, uh, but if you choose the year by year process, it does come at a bit of a cost impact. That's up to council to determine. Um, from my perspective and the reason that officers recommended the four year guaranteed was because I personally didn't want the Brimbank ratepayers to have to be disadvantaged in a sense, because they are probably not going to have an option other than landfill in that period anyway. So it is one of those issues uh, look, I'm aware uh, off the record that a lot of the councils will be guaranteeing their waste for four years. Um, some of them have done it behind closed doors in the decision making, um, haven't done it in the open and transparent way that Brimbank chooses to do our contracts. And so that's obviously something that will come out to play in, in sort of uh, over time as questions get asked of other councils. But, uh, you know, I'm aware of a number of other councils in the West that will be guaranteeing, you know, well, have already, some have already made the decision and some are about to make the decision, will probably guarantee it for the four-year period because I think they have recognised they might as well get the benefit in the reduced price given there won't be an alternative. Notwithstanding everything I've said there, I understand that Brimbank has got a political issue in terms of the former contaminated landfill sites we're managing. We've had the Kielba fire going for over 12 months, which has been incredibly impactful on the, the areas of Kielba and wider than that. We've got a whole range of other issues of landfill, as we all know, in terms of the Sunshine, former Sunshine landfill. So I, I understand why council's considering, you know, the option of whether it is a year by year proposal. 
Um, I suppose the, the end of the day, you have to weigh up whether we're prepared to pay that impost uh, for the higher rate to have some flexibility that in, our, in, in only my assessment as officer, it's all I can do, I can give you my frank and fearless advice, is that I think it'll be unlikely there'll be an alternative in the next four years to landfill. But ultimately it's up to the councillors or the council to decide what's best for Brimbank. Madam Mayor, have we still got you? Councillor Bork had her hand up. Oh, Sorry, Councillor. Uh, yes. Thank, thank you. Hello. Just a bit of a Can segue from what Councillor Tacos was saying. Um, uh, Jill mentioned the 65 million composting facility and then the you know, and I was really tempted to ask her, how did they manage to get that? I mean, I don't know whether it is appropriate to bring it up. Oh, you. yeah, no, that's fine, Councillor Borg. That's, that's a good question. Um, look, it, it was probably something she could have, because that's fairly new and only just uh, been implemented in the last 12 months, um, we've been fortunate in Brimbank that we've got access to a composting facility up, up in the north, um, which is at the Bullis site. And mm. Councillor Lancashire, I think, as he said before, has visited that site. That's where currently our green waste uh, is processed. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we've already got a facility in the northwest. So in a funny sort of a way, the northwest was probably ahead of the game uh, compared to the southeast in terms of organics processing. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had that contract in place for a number of years. It was a joint procurement process that we went through with a number of councils. There's about, oh, Tom, you'd know better than me, but I think 10 or so councils from the Northwest region that access that for their green waste. Well, and that facility is, is okay. able to take um, FOGO, as we call it, food or organics and green organics waste. So once part of the process for us transitioning to the four bin system, and, and in particular, the FOGO bin, yeah. our waste would potentially, well, very likely will go to that site because we are contracted there for well another 10 years or so uh, for our green waste. But it, it was always developed on the basis that they could take food waste as well when we were ready to implement that service. Thanks for that, Nick, thank you. And I think it was and, 40 million when oh, it, a couple of years ago. <laughs> so a bit cheaper uh, four or five years ago. Councillor Newen, you have your hand up, yeah? I guess like, I'd just like to explore some options with you and see what you think about it. So if we went with option A, which is to look at ourselves with a four-year contract, can we still go ahead with pursuing a processing facility? Sorry, I'm not sure of the question, Catherine. Can you explain that one again? Um, so if we go with option A, which is to lock ourselves on the four-year contract, in the interim, can we still go ahead with pursuing a processing facility? So after the four years, there will be alternative landfill waste? Yeah, look, I mean, that that's exactly what um, Jill was explaining, that <clears throat> the current focus of Metro Waste is on the southeast because of the, she used the word burning platform, which, which actually made me laugh a little bit because we've probably got a bit of a, blur, a burning platform out of Kiolba. Uh, sure. But anyway, that's a separate issue. But, um, you know, from my perspective, yes, um, there's nothing to stop the process of going down the path of a procurement process for advanced waste processing. Um, all, all we would be doing uh, in entering this new contract is guaranteeing either for four years or for one year at a time, the waste that we currently collect or the lesser amount that we collect if we implement the four bin system to that site. That's all we're doing. So we're rather than suggesting, you know, so some councils might say, oh, look, we don't want to guarantee our waste to MRL because you know what? We might take some of it to the landfill in uh, Willert up in the north. We might take some down to the wet, to West Roads in Werribee. We might take some to MRL. They might like to keep their options available. Um, I'm not sure why they do that, but, but there, there would, would be an option to do that. Um, yeah. Our officer recommendation on, on MRL is, is purely based around one, it is the most economical outcome um, given uh, its landfill gate prices that they've tended. But secondly, from our perspective, it is the most uh, uh, financially viable from a transport perspective because it is within close proximity. It's not in Brimbank, but it's in Melton and very close to Brimbank, as we all know. If we were to choose one of the other two landfills, for example, we would have to look at either putting on additional garbage collection vehicles because of the amount of time it takes to travel to those other landfills, or we would have to look at doing what some other councils do, say in the Southeast, actually bulk hauling it. So our little collection vehicles that pick up the bins would come back to a central point, you tip it into a compaction vehicle and then run that larger vehicle out to those landfills. There is a huge cost to do that because you need all the infrastructure 
to be able to transfer the waste from truck to truck. And you also have the additional costs of all that extra trucks and extra travel time. So yeah. that's why clearly the recommendation is based around using the MRL uh, landfill, even though I know council has had issues in the past in using that facility. And, and mm -hmm. the mayor's comments are right, you know, in terms of there is kind of concern about us continuing to use landfills that we don't necessarily want in close proximity. But the reality is those landfills are there and they're going to be used by someone. I suppose yeah. the key decision council needs to consider is whether we get the financial benefit of using that landfill, given it's there anyway, um, or whether we choose to do something different. Mm -hmm. And to follow up with that, so hypothetically, like I think what Councillor the mayor was saying before, like if we sign ourselves four years to clean away, she like it's saying that you know we're contradicting ourselves because we're saying no to them to getting toxic soil to rabbit hole, right? Sure. So if we were to go with option B, which is year to year, would that give us any leverage in advocating to say no to toxic soil to rabbit hole? So if, for example, in the first year we say yes, clean clean away. And then if negotiations with the state government were looking like it's Raven Hole will be the site, we'll be able to go, okay, because we're doing a one-to-one -to -one year contract, like we don't like this, we're going to threaten as a bargaining chip to be to a different landfill company. Is that an option? Um, I'll, I'll be frank and, um, and, and clear. I don't think Clean Away would, would impact their operations. They are a very large landfill. They accept waste from a large percentage of Melbourne, not only from municipal waste, but they have a large amount of waste coming through the commercial and industrial sector. And so really, they wouldn't even notice if we didn't go there, to be honest. Um, and so I think that's probably a bit stretching our ability to leverage um, you know, our, our landfilling component to our advocacy component. And one of the reasons, um, you know, Dan and myself will keep quite separate about these issues is, you know, Dan's role as the director of obviously um, advocacy is one of his key areas. We'll always take the lead about advocating for the best outcomes for Brimbank around these issues. I'm the guy that's responsible to report back to council about the best operational outcomes. And so clearly my recommendation is based on the best outcome from a financial perspective knowing that really is no other alternative for land for our garbage in the next four years. So uh, I get where you're coming from, Councillor Nguyen. I, I, I'm honest and uh, clear. I don't think it would make any difference whatsoever. Yeah, thanks for that. Councillor David. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was going, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Councillor Lancashire, please, a question. In ref he's sitting in the past four years um, as a member for the Metro West uh, West Management, um, what's the reaction of the other reps there, um, um, Councillor Langashar? What 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 they are actually discussing there in reference to this the same the same problem we have, I suppose. Yeah. Look, um, having been on Metro Waste for four years, um, I, I would clearly say that the best result that I could see um, going forward is two things. The FOGO um, plant um, is excellent. The $400 million recycling plant is excellent. And for environmental reasons, I'm not that fond of pumping into the atmosphere vast amounts of CO2 um, from burning waste that's look energy to uh sorry waste to energy is, is has some appealing points but the best results are those two in what i've seen the 400 million dollar plant and mm -hmm. and the fogo now i would looking at that I, I guess the frustration we have is that this contract's become entwined with a whole lot of other issues um, that we're suffering. And uh, I guess um, I, I would take it up that um, uh, very much a case of it may be necessary to separate the two and to push this into Dan's area of advocacy and that we go, um, I'd much rather see a budget, a substantial budget to advocate for FOGO, advocate for the $400 million plant 
and advocate that they start to get to work on the northwest, just as they have in the southeast, but get going on that as quick as possible, and that we become a leader in pushing for those innovations for the northwest. Um, well, so that's look having we, we can start we can start work on that and perhaps uh, uh, communicate with the rest of the northwest uh, municipalities, but that will take some time. It will take time, but I think um, it, it's uh, th these are worthwhile things to work towards, and um, it is an advocacy issue. And maybe we need to separate the two. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from anyone? Can everyone hear me? Yep. Questions. We can hear you, Madam Mayor. That's fine. Okay. So, councillors, just sorry, just before we move on, um, obviously at the special council meeting next week, um, it will be very difficult for uh, questions or clarifications of officers because of the nature of that is commercial in confidence. Um, so, you know, by all means, uh, contact me in advance of the meeting if there is anything else you need clarification around. Um, if there is a councillor that's proposing um, an amended motion uh, along the lines of, you know, either rather than accepting the four year guaranteed going with either a year by year or even non guaranteed, it would be good to perhaps know about that in advance. And perhaps that could be a discussion between all councillors in relation to the thinking behind that. It will be very problematic to debate uh, in relation to the issues because of the confidential nature. So, for example, councillors won't be able to disclose, you know, the difference in, in cost to Brimbank ratepayers of the three different options, because it would obviously then be disclosing that confidential information. If there was a need at the council meeting to go into discussion about that, we will need um, to have someone move and second to move into what, they, what we call a confidential closed session of council. Um, and then obviously have to move out of that for, uh, for obviously decision-making around a motion and then uh, voting on that. Um, so I suppose I'm strongly encouraging um, councillors to try and have as much discussion as you can in advance of the special council meeting. I'm happy to, to talk to anyone uh, that needs further clarification because it will be a bit constrained as part of that special council meeting given the confidential nature of the details. When is the special, sorry um, Madam Mayor, when is the special council meeting? I don't have it in my diary. Uh, it's Tuesday. scheduled for Tuesday the 2nd of March at 6 p.m. So just in advance of the session. Oh, it's council meeting. Is that it? <coughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. That's it. So it's just to reinforce... This to be discussed. Yeah, just to reinforce Neil's point, obviously the report itself and what the report talks about, the recommendation, the decision you'll be making will be public, of course. It was. It's the attachments and the um, commercial information contained within those attachments which can't be publicly ventilated. All right, sounds like we're done on that item, I think, Madam Mayor. Oh, has Ronco frozen? I can't go through my um, list on computer. So what's next? Uh, item 2.4 we had was um, the development of the Alfreda Street Master Plan. That was really listed as a briefing note. So that's in the agenda pack. Uh, and it was really just if there's any questions or queries about that. Uh, otherwise we can take it as read. I have a question. Um, it, do I direct it to you, Neil? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, the last two years we've had the Alfreda Street um, uh, consultation committee, or you know, it was in regards to the precinct. Um, now that's finished. So what, what's going? Is it something going to be taken in its place to sort of oversee this master plan? Because or is it just that was just set up temporarily? Sorry, I'm not, are you talking about the? I'm not sure which. You, the you're precinct. Not, the, you're not talking about the Arrington precinct master plan, are you? No, no. This is the actual St Albans one, the one that's got the police on it. It's got all the the, the traders on it. The. Um, so is that the St Albans Town Centre um, Committee? 
Yeah, that could be it, yeah. yeah. I think you were nominated to that committee as part of that process, is that correct? Yes, is that continuing? Well, I, I assume so, can, uh, given that we've just appointed you as the councillor. So. No, oh, sorry, I've got it confused because there's two, and that's what I wanted to ask. Uh, oh, so the other one must have been... Um, Errington. Errington. Yes, yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay, no problem. Just just so we're clear, though, that the, the initial um, details in the briefing note... To, so we, we're about to commence uh, subject to any comments or feedback from councillors tonight, um, the initial consultation on the Alfreda Street Master Plan... Um, so if you haven't had a chance, have a good look at the, the briefing note and there's an issues paper that was attached, which is really quite detailed. Yeah. Um, quite an exciting project, actually, and something that I think uh, St Albans uh, residents and the traders will be uh, interested to engage with. The, the uh, community consultation and engagement is quite detailed. So we're looking at a whole range of different initiatives. We're, we're doing some, uh, some walk-a-thons, so walking, walking tours. We're doing some... Uh, other, you know, pop-up sort of uh, sessions. Young, young people and yeah, older people. A whole range of, uh, of yeah. engagement over a, almost a two-month period because that will really help us inform the preliminary thinking around developing the draft master plan. And we'll obviously come back to councillors after we've done that initial consultation to provide you all the feedback about that and our initial thoughts about what the master plan might look like. And then obviously we'll progress forward and develop the master plan and once again come back to councillors before we eventually go out more broadly to the community. Um, and we'll look at all those groups that we've got and consult with them, them as we always do. Yes, Councillor Anxia. Microphone, please. You're on mute there, Bruce. Yeah. Sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, look, look I, I haven't gone into it as much as I would have liked to. It seems really exciting and, and the consultation seems great. Um, if I could probably uh, only make one comment about it is that um, just to consider the tourism aspect of um, that area and more being more reflective of the, uh, uh, the Vietnamese French influence um, of, of or, or let's say the French influence on Vietnamese culture that um, uh, creating more of a cultural center for St Albans. Um, it, it does look to me from an urban design point of view that we're, we're, we're heading down the path towards a really good um, uh, urban design. Um, however, uh, I'd probably like to see a good urban design with a tourism cultural theme to it. Um, so I have a, a little bit of a bent in that area, if you like. Cool. Yeah, no, that's um, really I'd only make that as a comment. No, no, that's a really valid comment. And look, to be honest, we'll, yes, it, the project's been led by our urban design team, obviously, uh, given the nature of, of what we're developing a master plan, but there is a cross council group um, that's involved, including, you know, obviously our, um, our business team, our economic development team, um, will engage with the traders, you know, heavily around the process. So it will be a real focus of the master plan about what, what we want to deliver through public realm upgrades and improvements uh, over many years into the future that will really deliver what the best outcomes are for that area. So it's a very valid comment, Council Action. I'll make a note of that and talk to the team about it. Uh, Thank you. Note as well in regards to culture. Please don't try to gentrify off Beta Street, the St Albans area. It's like, yeah, don't gentrify it. Keep, keep the culture in there. Um, also on page 62 of the, the plan, like it, for the traders, I would also make a note that they may also have low English proficiency as well. So making sure that when we, walk, when we talk to the traders on the street that you have an interpreter with them as well. Cause like some of them might, yeah. Like there's that whole Vietnamese thing, like, like it, they're very harmonious, you know and they're not like very polite. So in terms of being honest and stuff. So like try to get it. it yeah. No, yeah, the, yeah. And really what I suggested last time is that the place manager that we've got out there, Jinsia, walk around with the Vietnamese interpreter and actually speak to the traders because Jinsia is fantastic. But as you said, the predominance of Vietnamese and other multicultural speak, uh, speaking um, businesses, it's really important that we get their feedback on the master plan because it it encompass they're encompassed in it. Yeah, so um, I, I think Chinsia did have um, 
uh, a youth leader uh, from the Brimbank Council that was fantastic. And she was uh, assisting Chinsia with speaking <coughs> to the Vietnamese traders. So if they can do that and speak to Bosnian businesses and other businesses there to get their feedback would be really good. Yeah, look, look no, we well recognise that. that if, you, if you look at the details in the, in the comms plan that's included in the briefing, there's very uh, there's a lot of detail about making sure we engage with with as many people as we can, including using translators, um, bilingual workers. We obviously will use through council as well. So obviously we've done a fair bit of consultation at St Albans when we did the Civic Plaza project um, over a number of years, and that was very successful. That process. So we're we're using that process and expanding it with um, you know cultural sensitive uh, engagement. Absolutely. So we're well aware of that. Thanks, councillors. All right, poor, poor Dan has waited all night for the last item, so, and Julian. So, Madam Mayor, if there's no further questions, we might move to 2.5. Yep, I don't think so. Over Fantastic. You, um, I know a lot more about waste now, <laughs> which is a good thing if we're going to do some advocacy on it as well, but that's a discussion for another night. Um, okay. Um, Briefing note uh, has been provided rather than the presentation, the draft councillor gift policy 2021. It's an obligation under the 2020 Act. Um, it's in the council report, um, including this document for endorsement is intended to come to the March meeting of council, where it will go out for a uh, period of public consultation for two weeks. Um, I won't go into any further detail other than let's take it as read and Julian and I are happy to take any questions in relation to the draft councillor gift policy, what you can take and what you can give. Yes, Councillor Lancashire. I'd like to know whether a, um, if all the councillors get a recycling bin, is that a gift? Not if we make you pay for it, Councillor Lancashire. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. No, I think I, I, I think I think we might we'd, we'd find an appropriate accommodation, Bruce. <laughs> Any more questions? No. All right. Easy way. I don't think we'll be accepting any gifts, so. Yeah, we'll see what they come back with, but um, it's part of our engagement policy. But yeah. Thank you. That's it. Done. <laughs> Thanks, councillors. Appreciate. Sorry. Thank you, councillors. All the best. Thanks. Have a great night, night. people. Good Thank night. you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Thank everyone. Thank Bye. you. All the best. See you, Sam.